Good afternoon and welcome to our June 28, 2022 board business meeting. Welcome to our board members, MCPS staff, and members of our community who are joining us here today and to those who are watching this media, this meeting via live stream on the MCPS website and MCPS TV. Let us begin by standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'll now call the roll to establish that we have a quorum. We're being joined today by Ms. Harris on video, so I'm going to start with her. Ms. Harris? Good afternoon, everyone. Ms. Aluni? Good afternoon. Nice to see everyone. Ms. Mandrowski? Good afternoon. Hello. Ms. Silvestri? Good afternoon. Dr. Daka? Good afternoon, everyone. And Ms. Evans? Good afternoon. And Dr. Joftis is unable to be with us today. Now we can begin this meeting with the approval of the agenda. So moved. Second. All in favor, say aye. Raise your hand. Oh, okay. Revised agenda. Can can we get a motion? Move approval of the revised agenda. I'll second. All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. Thank you. Um, next, we will have the Human Resources and Development Report. Move approval. No, we haven't. We haven't done it. It's Dr. It's Dr. McKnight. Yes. Yeah, we're up to item number three. Okay. Very good. Um, thank you. So today we are bringing forward recommended appointments, and I am uh, thrilled to bring forth our appointments today. And I'll begin with our first appointment, Dr. Peggy Pugh, who is bringing forward to be appointed as the Chief Academic Officer. Dr. Pugh brings to Montgomery County Public Schools more than 27 years of experience as a teacher, supervisor, secondary principal, associate superintendent of curriculum and instruction, and most recently as the associate superintendent of administration and leadership. Dr. Pugh looks forward to joining MCPS to advance the board and the superintendent's strategic plan for academic excellence. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. I, I, Lynn, I can't see her. I guess, I guess it's kind of hard to switch, switch back and forth. But it's unanimous of those here at the table. Thank you. Next, we are bringing forward for appointment Mrs. Diane D. Morris as the associate superintendent of school support and well-being in the Office of School Support and Well-Being. Mrs. Morris has been employed with Montgomery County Public Schools for 23 years as a special education teacher, resource teacher, student support specialist, assistant principal, principal intern, principal, director, and most recently as area associate superintendent in the Office of Teaching, Learning, and Schools. Mrs. Morris looks forward to joining the Office of School Support and Wellbeing, where she will focus on improving student outcomes by promoting and supporting the well-being of students, staff, and the communities in which she will serve. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous of those at the table. Thank you. Next, we bring forward Mrs. Valeria B. De Silva in the as a director in the Office of Student and Data Systems in the Office of Technology and Innovation Office of Strategic Initiatives. Ms. De Silva has been employed with MCPS for 15 years as a development project manager, supervisor for strategic projects, supervisor for systems design and development, and most recently as a supervisor of learning management systems and development. In her new role, Mrs. De Silva looks forward to continuing the partnership with MCPS leadership, offices, schools, students, and parents. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. <laughs> 
Next, we have bringing forward for appointment Ms. Dr. Marjorie D. Lope Mustastos as director in the Office of District-Wide Professional Learning in the Office of Strategic Initiatives. Dr. Lope Musatsos has been employed with MCPS for 17 years as an instructional assistant, an English teacher, a resource teacher, coordinator, instructional specialist, acting supervisor, assistant principal, coordinator, and most recently as assistant chief for professional learning and development in the Office of Human Resources and Development. Dr. Lope Musatsos looks forward to continuing the professional development and learning work for the district in collaboration with the strategic initiatives team. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. Thank you. <laughs> Next, uh, we have bringing forth the appointment of Mrs. Angela S. McIntosh Davis as the director of the Division of Procurement in the Department of Materials Management in the Office of Finance and Operations. Mrs. McIntosh Davis has been employed with MCPS for more than four years as a team leader in the procurement unit. Mrs. McIntosh Davis has looked forward to assisting the superintendent in her mission and building upon her collaboration with schools and central office staff in providing products and services that best serve our students and staff. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. That is unanimous. Next, I bring forward the appointment for Ms. Nichelle D. Owens as a director in the Division of Early Childhood, Title I Programs and Recovery Funds in the Office of Teaching, Learning, and Schools. Ms. Owens has been employed with MCPS for 21 years as a Technology Instructional Specialist, Title I Instructional Specialist, Title I Supervisor, and most recently as Acting Director in the Division of Early Childhood, Title I Programs, and Recovery Funds. Ms. Owens looks forward to continuing the work with the Division of Early Childhood, Title I Programs, and Recovery Funds. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. That is unanimous. <laughs> Next, we move forward for appointment, Mrs. Catherine Breuer as Supervisor for Professional Learning and Achievement in the Office of School Support and Wellbeing. Mrs. Breuer has been employed with MCPS for more than 10 years as a social studies teacher, a team leader, staff development teacher, and most recently as executive director in the Office of Teaching, Learning, and Schools. Mrs. Breuer is passionate about the power of professional learning and giving all staff the necessary support to do their jobs effectively. She looks forward to supporting our schools by working with our talented learning and achievement specialist. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. That is unanimous. For our next appointment, we bring forward Mr. Evan H. Bernstein is the principal of Little Bennett Elementary School. Mr. Bernstein has been employed with MCPS for 30 years as a classroom teacher, staff development teacher, assistant principal, principal intern, and most recently as principal at Forest Knowles Elementary School. Mr. Bernstein looks forward to joining the Clarksburg community to support Little Bennett Elementary School. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. That is unanimous. Thank you. The next appointment that I bring forward is Ms. Anita Chan as principal of Carter Rock Springs Elementary School. Ms. Chan has been employed with MCPS for 11 years as a classroom teacher, staff development teacher, assistant principal, and most recently as principal intern at Fields Road Elementary School. It is with great pride that Ms. Chan joins the Carter Rock Springs Elementary School to continue the school's long-standing commitment to excellence and to share the passion and love of learning so that all students can be challenged to reach their highest potential. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. <laughs> Thank you. The next appointment coming forward is Mrs. Ancy, Angie L. Fish as principal of Flower Valley Elementary School. 
Mrs. Fish has been employed with MCPS for 19 years as an English teacher, resource teacher, assistant principal, central office administrator, and most recently as an acting principal at Rocky Hill Middle School. Mrs. Fish is excited to serve Flower Valley Elementary School and work collaboratively to inspire all children in becoming lifelong learners as they light the way for the community. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. That is unanimous. Thank you. Next, coming forward for appointment is Mr. Brent T. Mascot as principal of Weller Road Elementary School. Mr. Mascot has been employed with MCPS for 24 years as a teacher, administrator, and most recently as principal of Harmony Hills Elementary School. Mr. Mascot is excited to serve the Weller Road School community as its next principal. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. That's unanimous, thank you. <laughs> Next, bringing, coming forward for appointment is Mr. Ron K. Morris as principal at Jones Lane Elementary School. Mr. Morris brings to MCPS more than 30 years of experience as an educator and most recently as the Performance, Equity, and Community Response Director. Mr. Morris is honored to join MCPS as the principal at Jones Lane Elementary School and looks forward to serving the student, staff, families, and communities. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. That is unanimous. Thank you. And our final appointment for today is Ms. Glit Zalkauer as principal of Stedwick Elementary School. Ms. Zalkauer has been employed with MCPS for 20 years as an English language development teacher, instructional specialist, and most, most recently as the principal at Highland View Elementary School. Ms. Zalkauer is thrilled at having the opportunity to partner with students, staff, and families of the Stedwick community. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. That is unanimous. Thank you, President Wolf. That completes the appointments. Thank you. We'll give them a minute. Okay, we're now up to item four, which is recognitions. And I'm going to take the privilege as chair of going before Dr. McKnight to recognize that we have lost a giant in the education field. Reggie Felton, who served on the board from 1994 to 2004, has gone on to glory. I hope people aren't offended by that. On June 11th, 2022, he was the first African-American president of the school board, and he continued to champion public education until the day he died. So on behalf of the Board of Education, I'd like to offer this declaration. And I'm going to read it in its entirety. And when you have somebody that has done as much as Mr. Felton has done over the years, it gets rather lengthy, so I hope you'll bear with me. Whereas Mr. Reginald Reggie Felton, who passed away 
on June the 11th, 2022, devoted himself to public education, having served on the Montgomery County Board of Education from 1994 to 2004, and whereas Mr. Felton also served as the first African American to be elected the Board of Education president and was reelected to serve as president for two more terms and vice president for two terms. And whereas Mr. Felton served on the Montgomery College Board of Trustees from 2007 to 2015, promoting partnership and support for students with a focus on early education all the way through to adult and senior citizen education. And whereas Mr. Felton was very active with the Montgomery County branch of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, where he served as chairman of the Freedom Fund Dinner, vice president for programs, and a member of the board of directors. And whereas Mr. Felton served proudly on the University of the District of Columbia Board of Trustees as treasurer and chairman of multiple committees where he further displayed his devotion to public education. And whereas Mr. Felton was a civic activist who was a community leader and was appointed by the county executive to serve as the first chairman of the Silver Springs Center Citizens Advisory Board representing and advocating for his community, and whereas Mr. Felton continued to serve his community as treasurer of the Rudolph W. Snowden Memorial Scholarship Fund and vice president and board member of the George P. Thomas Learning Academy, Incorporated, the longest continuous operating community-based tutorial program in Montgomery County. And whereas the legacy of service Mr. Felton bequests to Montgomery County Public Schools and Montgomery County is inspiring and his efforts will long resonate. Now therefore be it declared that the Board of Education and Montgomery County Public Schools honors and remembers Mr. Reginald Felton for his outstanding work on behalf of children and families and joins with his family and the community in celebrating his life his work, and his commitment to creating a more caring, equitable, and exceptional school system in county. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that is unanimous of those that I could see here at the table. Uh, would any board members like to say anything at this time before we move on? No, I'm glad you brought up the George B. Thomas Learning Academy and being the longest serving organization with students and he was one of the founding members as a member of Omega Sci-Fi, which started this program and, and George B. Thomas, of course, was a member of the organization as well. Thank you, Dr. Docker. Ms. Madrowski. Yeah, I just want to um, echo your words about what a huge loss this is for the um, education, the world of education. Um, he was someone who not only dedicated his whole life to uh, advocating and being part of the educational world, he was a tremendous mentor to so, so many, including some of our state legislators and, um, and all of us as board members. Um, he was such a generous person with his time and um, information, and he will be very sadly missed. Thank you. Okay, at this time, Dr. McKnight, you can proceed. Thank you, President Wolf, and I too extend my deepest condolences on behalf of the NCPS family to Mr. Felton's um, family. Uh, this is a significant loss for our community, and I hope that this family knows that we as a school system, um, along with the board, will be there to support in any way needed. Um, I do have a number of recognitions that I am excited to bring forward today. Um, and the first recognition I have is recognition for the Distinguished Hispanic Scholars. The Hispanic Alliance for Education recognizes Hispanic high school seniors who have been identified as Distinguished Hispanic Scholars through academic excellence, community involvement, and leadership. The Hispanic Alliance for Education has awarded scholarships to Distinguished Hispanic scholars from each of our 26 high schools in Montgomery County Public Schools. Montgomery County Public Schools honors and supports the many contributions of Hispanic American students to our schools, our community, our state, and our country. 
Montgomery County Board of Education celebrates Montgomery County Public Schools for holding a high standard of academic excellence and recognizing the outstanding achievement of Hispanic American students. Now, therefore, be it resolved that on behalf of the Interim Superintendent of Schools, staff members, students, and parents and guardians of the Montgomery County Public Schools, the members of the Montgomery County Board of Education, we congratulate the recipients of the 2022 Distinguished Hispanic Scholars Award. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. That is unanimous of those here at the table. Yes. I did want to ask, do we have any of those students here? Okay, if so, I wanted you to stand. I was <laughs> yeah. hoping so. Yes. Thank you. Our next recognition is that we are recognizing or bringing a recognition for Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity um, Incorporated Scholars. The Gatesburg Rockville Alumni Chapter of Kappa, Kappa, Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated Kappa Youth and Community Foundation has awarded six scholarships to Montgomery County Public Schools students. The Gatesburg Rockville Alumni Chapter of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated, Kappa Youth and Community Foundation's main focus is to provide opportunities for young people who dream of going to college a reality. The Gatesburg Rockville Alumni Chapter is committed to providing encouragement and support to young African-American students so that they may see a future for themselves that includes a college education. The Montgomery County Board of Education is proud that the Montgomery County Public Schools continues to celebrate the many accomplishments of its diverse student body and its community partners. Now therefore be it resolved that on behalf of the Interim Superintendent of Schools, staff members, students, parents, and guardians of Montgomery County Public Schools, the members of the Montgomery County Board of Education congratulate the class of 2022 Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated Kappa Youth and Community Foundation Scholarship recipients. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll ask if any of those recipients are here. Okay. We still congratulate them. <laughs> Our next recognition is recognition of Vietnamese scholars. The Association of Vietnamese Americans awarded $1,000 scholarships at the 31st Annual Academic Award Ceremony held on Sunday, June 5th, 2022 to two Montgomery County Public School students for their excellent academic performance, outstanding leadership skills, and stellar community involvement. For the past 34 years, the Association of Vietnamese Americans has recognized outstanding Vietnamese American students attending Montgomery County Public Schools with the goal of assisting Vietnamese American students to achieve their higher education goals and to have a strong determination to receive a higher education. Montgomery County celebrates the many accomplishments of Vietnamese American students and the Montgomery County Board of Education is proud that Montgomery County Public Schools continues to recognize the academic achievements of Vietnamese American students. Now, therefore, be it resolved that on behalf of the Interim Superintendent of Schools, staff members, students, parents, guardians of Montgomery County Public Schools, the members of the Montgomery County Board of Education, we all congratulate the recipients of the 2022 Association of Vietnamese Americans Academic Awards and Scholarships. Move approval. Second. <clears throat> all in favor, raise your hand. That is unanimous. Thank you. Are any of them here? Are any here? Are any of the recipients here? Okay. Let's stop. Okay. Okay. So we congratulate all of our award recipients. I'm very proud of the work that they've done and just recognizing them. In the spirit of recognizing students, there is one more uh, a group of students that I would like to recognize. And I came in with the paraphernalia to just celebrate the work that they have done that I know has just been profound and needed in our community. And that would be our students. And I want you to stand, actually, if you're here representing the Amplifier Journal. And you are here, Mr. your advisor, Mr. Uh, David, is David here? Mr. Lopato, OK. Is he not in the room? <laughs> have him come in. If he's out there, it'd be great if he could come in um, as the advisor for this group because their work has just been amazing. And I just wanted to highlight that this is a group of student journalists, for those who are not aware, um, and they produce a countywide magazine. Their countywide magazine, this is the most recent one um, that they completed, and I had to bring in the one from last year because I've kept it. So amazing. And, and they, it's just so wonderful. You'll see this is the print copy 
that they just did. And this is actually one that has the QR scan code, but I actually still have the print copy um, in my office. But I kept it because it was such a good example of the work and the, the, the just skill set that our students have in our community and how committed they are to making sure that we communicate in a very effective way. Uh, this, this magazine has been produced by students from 15 of our high schools. Um, I want to acknowledge that uh, BCC High School, where our advisor is, is supporting, has been a lead advocate for their work. They talk about really important issues that it's important for us to address. As you'll see last year, they talked about coming of age in the pandemic. And the topics were really focused on issues that our students want to hear about. You know, what are generational shifts that are happening that they're experiencing? And how did those experiences play out in their spaces, um, in the hallways, at lunch, in the classrooms? And so I just want to thank you all for the work that you do to elevate our student experiences. Your voices are always important, but over the past years when we could not connect together, you still found a way for the voices of our students to be elevated and shared with others. So I just wanted to acknowledge you for your work. And if you did not get a copy, they are also such good stewards. They left copies in the front <laughs> office, um, and they're all around Central. And again, um, if you haven't had the experience of, of seeing one of these, um, the work from our student journalists in the magazine, please grab one and take a look at it so that you can feel the same pride that I'm feeling about the voices that they capture in this written piece. Thank you. Thank you. Our next item on the agenda is public comments. Public comments is one of our opportunities to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. Board members will take your comments into consideration, but it is not our practice to take action at this time on issues that are raised. We encourage public input on policy, program, and practices. This is not the proper avenue to address specific student or employee matters, so we encourage everyone to utilize existing avenues of redress for complaints. This is a public meeting, and we expect the conduct of all speakers and members of the audience to be within the bounds of proper etiquette. Inappropriate personal remarks, rude retorts, or other such behavior is out of order and will not be tolerated. Those who demonstrate disruptive or disrespectful behavior during public comments may be asked to leave the room. Please check our website for information about upcoming board meetings, hearings, and work sessions, including any changes to our meeting start times. We have three people signed up to provide in-person testimony. Each speaker will receive two minutes for comments. When your name is called, please approach the table Speak clearly and directly into the microphone. 30 seconds prior to the expiration of a speaker's time, a yellow light will go on accompanied by a beep. A red light and a buzzer signals that your time has expired. Please push the flat button below the microphone to turn it on and begin speaking. Push the same button once more at the sound of the buzzer to turn it off. In addition to our in-person speakers today, we have four video presentations. We will play these submissions once the in-person testimonies have concluded. Copies of testimonies can be found on board docs where they are posted with the other materials for this meeting. At this time, I'm gonna call Eckerd Schneider, Thomas Murphy, and Hilary Swab to the table. Hilary Swab. Okay, I guess she's not here. Okay. Mr. Schneider, you may proceed by pressing the button. Yeah. Good afternoon, esteemed members of the Board of Education. My name is Eckert Schneider, and I'm proud to represent Team 4099, a first robotics team based in Pools Hill High School for one of this year's first world championship runner ups an event with well over 35,000 live viewers. However, I'd like to share our team's challenging journey leading up to this phenomenal achievement. Our team was founded in 2012, and despite the now decade-long existence of our team, we've struggled to pull enough support and resources to even build a complete robot. It actually wasn't until 2019 where we could build a robot competitive enough to qualify for our regional championship. 
As a, uh, as a county and school that prides and champions advancement of STEM in our classrooms, it's disheartening to see many robotics teams, including ourselves and those in the audience, face barriers to success due to the lack of support and resources. Every season, we continue to struggle with mustering enough staff support or mentors to supervise and coach our team as they are being asked to volunteer hundreds of hours after school without pay, quickly leading to burnout. Moreover, since the pandemic, it has become so challenging that we had to rely on community support to sustain our day-to-day -day operations. These same challenges persist all over the county as we have seen many schools join to compete but are forced to discontinue after a year because they don't have enough funding or school support to sustain long-term. We need to start developing strategies with your support to provide the necessary resources to help our students across the county explore STEM in and out of the classroom. In a post-pandemic world where technology has become crucial in our day-to-day -day operations, we need to start addressing these issues and increase opportunities to get involved in STEM. We need your help to make this happen. Thank you for your time and support. Thank you. Mr. Murphy. Good afternoon, <clears throat> Madam President, Dr. McKnight, members of the board, I'm Tom Murphy. It's a pleasure to be here. I wrote a statement, which I hope you'll consider, and I'll just summarize it here. At your last meeting, you voted to postpone adding financial literacy to the curriculum. I understand your reasoning, but I still think that's a mistake. Prior to your decision, you heard impressive, serious presentations from students showing the need here, and I commend them, and Ms. O'Looney in particular, for pressing this matter so persuasively. You reportedly said in rejecting the proposal, you're concerned about conforming with the education portions of the pending blueprint for Maryland's future. That's a reasonable concern, but if it's really a constraint here, I think it represents a case of the tail wagging the dog. You should not be faced with finding a way to fit financial literacy into this plan if the plan doesn't include financial literacy as a core education requirement and also give you room in the curriculum to deal with it. It's not a future plan at all because our students are our future and they know what they need and have said so. And I think you should push back on this as appropriate. This matter has been examined at length previously. The evidence of the need is clear. It's a mistake to kick this can down the road again, and doing so does not benefit our students long term. This is a real curriculum need we must face promptly if we're really doing our jobs as educators and parents. It's also a major equity issue because due to economic circumstances, some of our students may be able to learn some of this material at home, but others won't always have that opportunity. To be fair, financial literacy needs to be part of the curriculum for every student, and it really should be there now. Awaiting the outcome of an extended top-down deliberative process should not be an option. Thanks for your time. Thank you. We also received four video testimonies. First up is Jennifer Martin. Please play the video. Good afternoon. I'm Jennifer Martin, president of the Montgomery County Education Association, representing over 14,000 MCPS workers. Thank you, Dr. McKnight and members of the board for granting MCEA the opportunity to speak to you today. As we come to the end of a school year that has been the hardest of our careers, MCEA members are taking stock of all that we've endured and looking ahead to upcoming contract negotiations as a means of promoting the common good to benefit not only staff, but also our students and communities. I don't have to remind you that the last few years have been tiring and filled with anxiety for all those involved in MCPS, including you all as administrators of our school system. But in the storm of relentless and unexpected challenges over the last few years, we educators have persevered. Under crushing workloads that have exhausted and demoralized staff, our dedication and commitment to serving the young minds of Montgomery County nevertheless remains strong. Although difficulties persist, educators have routinely delivered high quality learning with care and compassion to meet students' needs. We have answered the calls of our communities and students. We have gone above and beyond over the last school year to ensure that our students are cared for and provided with the best education possible. Now that another school year's ended, MCEA wishes educators, students, parents, administrators, support staff, and the board members and Dr. McKnight some much needed rest and relaxation. We look forward to next fall as we negotiate a new contract and begin a new chapter. 
With our unwavering commitment to serving our students and meeting their needs, we hope that the board will fully support educators in the time ahead so that we're equipped with the time, resources, and professional respect needed for us to create the excellent academic experiences and the nurturing environment our students deserve. Next is Gretchen Gilmore. Please play the video. Hello board, my name is Gretchen Gilmore and I'm a sophomore at Wooten High School. In honor of Pride Month, I'm speaking on behalf of other trans and genderqueer students in MCPS to serve as a reminder that trans students' rights are incredibly important. I've spent the past two weeks week speaking with students from middle and high schools across the county to hear their stories. A great example of recent progress is the implementation of gender neutral bathrooms. Some schools have included gender neutral or all gender restrooms in their buildings, but other schools have none or very few, which are difficult to quickly reach without current plans to implement more. The lack of gender neutral restrooms directly correlates with the attention given to trans students. It's not just about going to the bathroom. It's about every student that has to go to the wrong restroom and leaves feeling unheard and uncomfortable. One student told me that in their cluster, changes impact them heavily, and they often seem to get the short end of the stick when it comes to accessibility. Another common theme with everyone I talked to was the, that they couldn't find any menstrual products in any bathroom. This is not only a conflict for cis female students, but also trans students with periods using all bathrooms. Other school systems in the country have explored using different facility designs and found success with those. In addition to facility issues, I was also informed about the use of homophobic and transphobic language that isn't often addressed by certain admin and teachers resisting the use of correct pronouns. MCPS has made great strides towards equity, but this all takes me back to a comment I received about admin and students excluding trans identities and issues in one of our high schools. The accessibility of restrooms, menstrual product placement, inclusive language in classrooms, and all the other things that seem like small details in the big picture still matter. My goal today is to remind MCPS employees that every day is a good day to think about trans students and what we can do to help them feel safe in our schools. Over the summer, while we're preparing for the new year, I hope we can keep the little things in mind. Thank you for your time. Next is Sia Badri. Please play the video. Hello, my name is Sia Badri and I'm a rising senior at Wooten High School. Ever since I can remember, I've always learned about white men. Reading Animal Farm in eighth grade, learning about Faraday's constant in chemistry class, studying Christopher Columbus's effects on global trade. And although it never felt intentional, I always felt an inexplicable detachment from the material taught in school. It, it always made me feel less than, like my life and my identity weren't uh, significant enough to be shown to my peers or the world. According to the MCPS website, 73.1% of students identify as people of color, so we must represent them for a more inclusive and welcoming society. When discussing widely known movements, many fail to mention women of color. For example, for the civil rights movement, many mention Martin Luther King Jr. Although his legacy goes without saying, it is vital to learn about the women who made significant contributions to the movement. For example, few know Dorothy Wright, the president of the National Council of Black Women for four decades. At the most well-known um, civil rights protest, the March on Washington, women weren't even allowed to speak, and Height was one of the women who was denied. Although this might seem like a lofty goal, there are actually many simple and effective ways to, um, to ensure that more women of color are taught. More books should be added to the MCPS school curriculum about marginalized people's experiences, and not just in the US, but internationally. We can add more women to history class, more groundbreaking experiments by women of color to science class, and more talented composers to our orchestra and band's repertoires across the county. I would love to work with you on adding more marginalized women to the curriculum. Thank you for your time. Our final video comes from Tyler Song. Good afternoon. My name is Tyler Song. I'm a student at Churchill High School and a member of the school robotics team, Bulldog Tech. I'm here today to ask for increased support from MCPS for school robotics. Currently, there are more than 60 robotics teams in Montgomery County. Many of those are school affiliated. I don't profess to speak for every robotics team, but teams across the county often face significant challenges. Personally, our team has dealt with countless problems this year like a plethora of financial issues, making it difficult for us to accommodate record high interest. 
Funding was hard to come by and we were forced to resort to a time-consuming process of writing grants that was essentially begging for financial support. This left our team with incredible uncertainty as to if we could buy parts, tools, or even whether or not we would be able to pay the registration fees in order to compete. And this became constant for essentially the season's duration. This and other logistical issues took up valuable time and attention away from the competitive aspect itself. The meetings were often a struggle in their own ways. Finding time beyond regular hour-long meetings during school hours was difficult, which greatly hurt our ability to make progress. So I'd like to offer a few ways in which Montgomery County could help. First, by offering funding to our robotics teams. And we aren't necessarily asking that the district fund the entirety of an expensive undertaking, but even a little bit would go a long way in our current situation. Um, we could also provide compensation to teachers and mentors who dedicate their valuable time to helping students explore their passions for engineering and technology. STEM careers are more important than ever in today's society, and robotics is a great way to grow interest in it. Participants in FIRST Robotics are more than twice as likely to enter STEM fields, especially females, meaning that it plays a role in closing the gender gap as well. Through our struggles in the past year, we've witnessed firsthand the adversity and challenges involved in running a FIRST team with limited resources. But this isn't just about us, it's about all MCPS school teams. We look forward to building a relationship in the future, if possible, so that every team can perform their best. Thank you. This will conclude our public comments. The next business meeting of the Board of Education for public comment is Tuesday, July 26. Sign-ups will open the evening of Tuesday, July 19th. In addition to the online sign-ups for public comment, we will return to the practice of in-person, same-day sign-ups when space allows. Beginning July 26, unlotted slots may be filled on a first-come, first-served basis on the day of the meeting. In order to sign up in person, please arrive at least 15 to 20 minutes before the start of the open session and sign the form. In-person sign-ups will close 15 minutes before public comments begins or when all slots are filled. So I would like to, to thank all of our students who came in today. And I just wanted to know if we could get some information about uh, these robotics teams and any support that's being provided um, and whether or not there's any ability to provide support or teacher compensation. I know you may not have that information now, but if you could just get that to us, that would be greatly appreciated by me. I also wanted to thank Sia Badri because she raises an important issue of inclusiveness, which is an issue that we are constantly, you know, striving to achieve. So I would really hope that we could work on getting women included in the curriculum. I know it's probably some in there, but I think we do need to look at the curriculum in terms of inclusiveness for all, all areas. And my last comment is that, um, about menstrual products in bathrooms. I don't know whether or not, I thought we had taken care of that problem, but apparently, which school was that? Um, um, Gretchen Gilmore is at Thomas Wooten. There must be some issue over there. Could we have somebody check on that? Yes. Thank you. Does anybody else have any comments? Ms. Madras? I was just gonna add on to what you said, um, in, including mm -hmm. in the, um, you know, um, non-gender bathrooms as well, because they might be in the, the ladies' rooms, but not in all of the bathrooms. And then um, I also just wanted to um, thank um, Gretchen Gilmore. Um, I loved what she said about today's, today's a good day to, to, to start advocating and to remember um, the good things. So um, thank you for the, our students. Anyone yes. else? Dr. Docker? Yes, uh, yeah, thank you. I wanted to uh, thank uh, the uh, young woman who, Siri, I think, Badri, uh, for talking about uh, women and students of color. We are looking at our curriculum now, and we're going to be talking about it um, uh, elementary in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that they have made some changes in their categories in there, which I really think are good. It's not just slavery with black people, but African-American history. I noticed that that was a big change and I think it's important. 
And we do thank you for your comments on the LGBTQ issues in bathrooms. And uh, I also wanted to uh, thank Mr. Murphy for coming. Uh, I know Ms. Mrs. Samondrowski and I are the ones who have worked the longest time with Mrs. O'Neill. And we know that you were one of her friends and her advisor. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you for supporting Hannah's idea about um, about finances, and we know how important that is. But I, I'm sure that we're going to do it, Hannah. We'll name it after you when we do it. <laughs> <laughs> you finished Miss O'Looney. Yeah, um, I actually have an answer to the, the question about menstrual products. Um, that was an issue that I worked on for before financial literacy. That was my big thing. Um, <laughs> so um, we, as a school system, all local school systems in Maryland are required to install free menstrual product dispensers, two in every secondary school mm -hmm. and one in every elementary school by October of this year. And then by October of 2025, in three years, we're required to have them uh, by state law in all female designated bathrooms. But last time we discussed as a board, um, it really feels like there's a commitment from our school system in particular to go above and beyond that requirement. As Ms. Gilmore mentioned, it is Pride Month, so the importance of placing those products also in non-binary restrooms as well as male restrooms. So in the spirit of celebrating things that our school system is uh, taking the lead on, I thought that was important to call out. Um, I also wanted to thank our students from robotics teams for coming out and testifying. Um, I really think that that's an important extracurricular to fund and focus on, not just because it's important to support students' academic pursuits, but also when we think about tying the role of a public school system mm -hmm. to economic development in this county mm -hmm. and continuing to make sure we have um, thriving industries and jobs for people. Mm -hmm. uh, robotics and engineering and technology are real growth industries right now. So uh, that's a strategic investment for us as a school system, and I hope we can look at that in the next operating budget. And then finally, thank you so much, Mr. Murphy. I'm sure financial literacy will come before this board again <laughs> very will. soon. I'll be back for that, requested. as I'm sure you will. Um, and I hope we can make that happen. I know we will make it happen. I just want to follow up on a comment Ms. O'Looney made and remind you that when, if we are looking to support robotics, and we should be, that we distribute equitably around the county, make sure that it's distributed so that everyone is allowed to um, participate. Ms. Mondrowski. Yeah, I just wanted to add, um, in the when you were talking about the funding part, stipends it would also be great if we can know how many stipends there are for teachers to support the clubs and stuff. Um, but I really wanted to take the second to um, acknowledge that um, today is our last board meeting with Ms. O'Looney, and um, just mentioned that you will be very, very missed. And I know we're doing a swearing out, but for, for public <laughs> reference, I just wanted to, uh, to put it out there that you've been a tremendous asset and incredible advocate and very, very um, loved and appreciated. So good luck. Ms. Silvestri. Yes, um, thank you for coming to testify in person and all the video testimony that we received as well. Um, so just as if I'm understanding this correctly, this must be not funded because they're not official uh, programs of the school, but rather affiliated as was stated because every school gets funding to support after school activities and stipends for teachers. Yes so that they can be compensated and so it's an I think it's an issue of adopting it as a school sponsored mm -hmm. activity which um, like I said every principal makes decisions about which activities uh, fall under this category or not if I'm if I'm not mistaken uh, Dr. McKnight. That is correct. Um, first I want to say thank you for coming forward. We need robotics teams in every single one of our schools for the reasons that Ms. Oluni um, mentioned earlier. I mean, you're leading in a lot of the work that, that's really dictating the workforce in the future. And so I just wanted to start with that so the system does see this is a very important um, activity and we want to continue to support. To what you mentioned, Ms. Silvestri, so every school does have an extracurricular activity fund. As a matter of fact, we recently increased the amount to schools to be able to utilize that extracurricular funding, um, uh, which can be available to support. 
clubs and, and student interests. So it really is up to every school to determine how that is allocated. Um, and so we know that different interests are, you are, are elevated in different schools, and the students should always drive that. Um, but as I listen to you talk, I, I, I am thinking one of the things that we're going to need to do is really work with our school leaders on how we're looking at what is fiscally available and making sure that it's being contributed to um, many of the organizations or the clubs that we see as important that, you know, there's a need to be able to support that. And if we find there's a conflict, um, then that's why we're here at Central to be able to put the support in place. So I think there are two things that we will follow up there in terms of working with our school leaders to get an assessment of what some of those issues are, and then if they need the additional support and can't reallocate based on what they've been given, then that's absolutely something that we can address. Thank you for bringing this forward um, to our attention. Yeah, you, you talked about increasing the stipend funds, and since Dr. Smith came and since you have been here, mm -hmm. you have done that. And there's some uh, organizations after school that are traditional, and they're always funded, and then the stipends are gone. So mm -hmm. we do need the extra stipends for uh, robotics and some of the other uh, mm -hmm. organizations that really contribute to students. And I just wanted to say thank you again to uh, Mr. Murphy for your testimony. Uh, agree completely that financial literacy is a must uh, for our students. And uh, just for the public and just to remind everyone, yes, now every high school will offer it as a class, uh, an elective. We didn't have that before and now every high school will offer it. Uh, we are also enhancing the curriculum of one of our math courses in, in high school so that it will be integrated into that math course as well. Uh, there will be virtual options, so if kids want to take it maybe over the summer, online, they can do that as well. What we haven't figured out is how to make it work for some of our English language learners which have no uh, extra classes to take because they have so many requirements. So we're almost there and uh, hopefully we can figure something out that works for everyone so it will be a requirement for graduation. And we'll be looking at it again Next in the year. fall. So thank you all for coming. Lynn has something. Oh, Lynn, go ahead. Yes, um, thank you. Um, first, I wanted to just add on to some of the recognition we did earlier for the uh, students and their sponsors who created the Amplifier um, system-wide student magazine because um, they received a, an amazing level of support from our print graphics department. And I have, you know, here, you probably can't even see them, but um, uh, a sampling of the programs from the commencement ceremonies I attended this, you know, in this commencement season all of them different, beautiful, honoring the traditions of each individual high school, but produced by our print graphics team, along with the what I think are the highest quality and nicest diplomas in the state of Maryland. So I just wanted to acknowledge how much work our print graphics team is doing to support our student journalists and our student graphic designers and all kinds of the work throughout the system. Um, and but I did, and I did also want to raise um, one of the things that Ms. Gilmore mentioned in her testimony. And thanks to to Mr. Snyder and Mr. and Mr. Song. And I'm glad that we're going to be reaching out to partner with them to figure out the constructive ideas they've had to better support the robotics teams throughout the county. Um, but um, Ms. Gilmore, one of the things that I've heard a lot from students across the county is uh, surrounds the, the issue of preferred names and how they may have an, um, you know, their, their school or their, their regular classroom teacher may honor preferred name issues, but if a substitute comes in, the, the um, class list they get from the main office does not contain a student's preferred name. And um, if that, you know, if we can look into normalizing and regularizing and, and reducing the, the bureaucratic burden on students, to get a preferred name included in their school records so that in whatever classroom, milieu, venue they find themselves, whomever they're working with addresses them by their preferred name. Um, I think that would be a, something that our, our students would appreciate. Thank you, Ms. Harris. I just wanted to say you're absolutely right. The print department does a fabulous yeah. job as does our TV department, as do our photographers that are all around. People don't realize how many behind the scenes people that we have that really, really support us and our students 
long after the school day has ended. So thank you. Ms. Madrowski. Really quick, just um, not that I don't want this to take away from our responsibility of funding uh, stipends and clubs, but I also did want to put out there um, you, to help spread the word, the MCPS Education Foundation um, has grants that can help support some of these type of programs, even if we offer some funding, but it's not enough. So just something to keep in mind. Okay, thank you. So we're now up one quick thing, okay. um, I wanted to add on to Ms. Harris. I know previously we had the technology office come to the board and talk about feedback sessions that we have with different services that we use. Mm -hmm. um, a suggestion that I might have is to reach out to um, our student view service um, and see if there is some way we can have students input their preferred names as well as pronouns so they automatically go on any attendance registry. Uh, thank yeah. you for that. Thank you. I just wanted to make a quick line. Thank you, Ms. Soloni. We will take that recommendation. Ms. Sharon is over there nodding her head, um, and we'll follow up to do that. And I, I do want to say, um, you know, we, we've set up a, a set of comprehensive guidelines for gender identity, and we did that as a system to ensure that we create the safe spaces with guidelines so that all of our students would be respected. And one of the guidelines specifically says that all students have the right to be referred to by their identified name or pronoun. And we all know that these guidelines don't always come into practice when it comes down to implementation of fidelity. Um, and so this is why hearing these stories and the examples of what happens allows us to be able to come back and say, how do we work with our school specifically when we've done the work to create those guidelines, but to make sure they, they're being implemented to, to create any unnecessary harm. So I wanted to, um, to thank Gretchen for bringing that forward. And um, yes, to share that. Thank you. We're now up to item six. I'll ask Dr. McKnight to proceed. Thank you for coming. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, President Wolf. Um, all right. I will welcome the team forward uh, to begin our presentation today on the new framework for elementary social studies trans, uh, social studies curriculum. I am very excited about us having this discussion, and I went back to public comment just now, Sia Baudry <laughs> is a perfect example of why the conversation we're having today is really important. Um, just a few years ago when we launched the anti-racist audit, I remember there were students from Kennedy High School sitting in those seats, and they were expressing some things about um, confusion that they had misunderstood over years about their own history, culture, and the context of all of that. Well, that was a few years ago before the pandemic, and I remember us having the conversation and saying, well, students have to have a good understanding of who they are and what their contributions are way before high school, because it is an elementary school in some of those formative years in which they are establishing their own self-worth confidence, and that comes back to the history and the worth of all of that. So I, I am excited that we're here and joined. Um, with the team today to really talk about and share the updates to the elementary social studies um, framework that is being brought forward today. Um, the Maryland State Department of Education has recently developed new frameworks for pre-K to five social studies education, and so they're gonna talk with us about that today as well. So again, I would just want up front, wanna thank Dr. Logan, Dr. Oliver, who are here today, um, not Dr. Mrs. Oliver, okay. Uh, <laughs> Mrs. Yes, putting it out there. Um, it's Oliver today because I, Oliver Gary, because I know they both have been working on this over time and have gotten lots of input from different stakeholders who are invested in this work. And so I just want to thank you for putting the time and attention into this because focusing on what we do with our elementary students is really going to build a strong foundation moving forward. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. I'm going to let Miss Oliver Gary, but I have to address that you got the pink memo. <laughs> we did not plan this. <laughs> I would like to start my presentation by thank you all, thanking you all for this time to present the changes to our elementary frameworks and our curricula based on the MSDE revisions. As a result of the revisions, this year we have been drafting our grades five, four and five social studies frameworks of which you received access to prior to this meeting in the board memo. With the approval of this Board of Education, MCPS will forward 
will move forward with the grades four and five frameworks for full development to be implemented in the 2023-2024 school year. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, this, on this one. Yes. <laughs> Social studies instruction is essential to the education of our students and society at large. Research has shown that when students receive consistent daily social studies instruction, elementary students' liter students' literacy skills increase. According to a Fordham Institute study, this is especially true for our emergent multilingual learners, or ELLs. It's important for our girls and students living in poverty. Natalie Wexler explained in The Knowledge Gap that social studies provides an understanding of the background knowledge and context in which ELA texts are situated, but are not explained. They are not explained because the author assumes that the students know that background knowledge and context. Without a doubt, and I am a little biased, social studies, social studies is the subject in which students engage in their daily lives and helps them to be productive participants in their communities. Social studies instruction promotes positive social behaviors, encourages students to build empathy and understanding of others, helps students to develop their problem-solving skills, and allows them to make real-world connections to their, to their learning. MSDE has revised its elementary social studies frameworks with a goal of students being able to actualize all of these conclusions. Next slide, please. Comar mandates that students learn about the six social studies standards. The previous MSDE frameworks included five of the six, which were civics, economics, peoples of the nation and world, which is basically culture, history, and geography. The sixth standard, social studies processes and skills, will be new for our elementary students and teachers. However, social studies processes and skills are not new for our secondary teachers and students. Next slide, please. Social studies processes and skills are disciplinary and inquiry literacy students employ to gain knowledge and understanding of political, historical, and current events. The way in which students should engage in social studies instruction should include reading and analyzing a variety of primary and secondary sources while applying social studies disciplinary literacy skills, or social studies thinking skills as we call them in MCPS. MSDE has adopted the Career College and Civic Life C3 framework as the foundation for inquiry literacies. Most of the inquiry literacies are embedded in the social studies thinking skills, which are sourcing, corroboration, contextualization, and interpretation. Currently, our secondary students learn how to apply these skills as they learn content. The MCAP, grade eight, and government assessments include the social studies processes and skills. Our elementary students will be taught social studies processes and skills based on their age appropriateness and in an age appropriate way. The goal of the MSDE revised frameworks is for students to develop the skills to identify problems in society and figure out ways to take informed action to do their part in holding our government and residents accountable to work towards a more perfect union that serves the common good. Next slide, please. There are additional major changes in the MSDE frameworks other than the social studies processes and skills. As I just stated, a major goal of social studies in Maryland is for students to become active participants in our democratic society. The focus on advocacy will be new for grades kindergarten through three. Our first and second grade students will be exposed to economic concepts such as systems of production and understanding the impact of economic choices. Just as students will be taught the social studies processes and skills in an age-appropriate way, the same will be true for these concepts. Second and third graders will now have lessons on environmental literacy, including on how humans impact the environment. However, the biggest changes in the MSDE frameworks are in grades four and five. The frameworks are not organized by standards as they were previously but are chronological to mirror how U.S. history is taught in U.S. History 8 and U.S. History 9. 
What was previously taught in fifth grade, such as early American history, will now be taught in fourth grade. The fifth grade content will start with the U.S. Constitution, and it will end in contemporary times. Both grades four and five will have expanded learning on African American history. Next slide, please. MCPS will implement our new frameworks incrementally. Last spring and summer, we gathered feedback from multiple stakeholder groups to hear from them about the things they wanted in our revised curricula. Last summer, we were able to hire teachers to compare the MSDE revised frameworks with the old frameworks to identify new content. This school year, the social studies team has been drafting grades four and five frameworks. This spring, we have been getting feedback on the draft frameworks from, from various stakeholders. In the upcoming fall, we will enter a request for a proposal process for grades four and five to then implement new curricula for grades four and five in the 2023-2024 school year. Next spring, we will enter a request for proposal process for grades kindergarten through third grade. However, we will implement, implement new curricula for grades two and three in the 2024-2025 school year. And in the following year, which is going to be the 2025-26 school year, we will implement new curricula for grades kindergarten and one. Next slide, please. As I just mentioned, OSIP received feedback prior to the creation of our revised frameworks and is in the process of getting feedback on the draft frameworks from stakeholder groups. In the spring of 2021, we surveyed school staff members to better understand the state of social studies instruction in our county, as well as for them to provide feedback on what they wanted to see in the revisions. We also asked social studies liaisons or social studies representatives to facilitate focus groups at their schools for grades um, for students in grades three through five. We held focus groups with teachers, MCCPTA representatives, and members of our action groups. This spring, we, will have, we have received feedback on the revised grades four and five frameworks from teachers, staff development teachers, reading specialists who support social studies, and the curriculum advisory assembly, in addition to the labor management collaboration group. And we are in the process of gathering feedback from community stakeholder groups to finalize our frameworks. Next slide, please. While we were purchased curricula for grades kindergarten through five, OSIP will need to work with teachers to create lessons that the vendor may not have, and those are gap lessons. Additionally, we may need to work with the vendor and our teachers to refine any lessons after they are implemented. Next slide, please. Our social studies curriculum frameworks will include our scope and sequences as well as other required components. Not only do we include the content from MSDE's frameworks, social studies processes and skills, but also we are required by Comar to expose students to personal literacy, personal financial literacy standards and environmental literacy standards. Due to the amount of content that is included in the MSDE grades four and five frameworks, we have devoted an entire marking period to um, in grade three for personal financial literacy, which is a substantial upgrade in our elementary um, curriculum. Next slide, please. Additional goals that have influenced our framework development based on feedback include embedding our local Montgomery County history in our curriculum, providing opportunities for students to connect what they are learning to contemporary issues and events, and embedding social justice standards as well as anti-bias and anti-racist content to include the narratives that represent our student population. The social justice standards are developed by learning for justice and promote anti-bias education by providing age-appropriate indicators that build students' capacity for opposing prejudice and taking informed collective action. Next slide, please. Because the social studies curriculum will have many changes, teachers will need professional learning. It will be imperative for MCPS to provide professional learning on the new content, including the vendor product, but especially on the history of African Americans. 
Teachers will also need access to learning to build their content knowledge of other historical, historically marginalized groups that will be included in our curriculum. And grade five teachers will need to learn about the contemporary period. Teachers will need to learn how to teach social studies using social studies processes and skills that include the inquiry literacies, social studies thinking skills, document analysis of varied primary and secondary sources, and teaching students how to take informed action. English language arts is not the only time students practice their literacy skills. As I stated at the beginning of my presentation, social studies is a literacy subject. OSIP social studies and ELA teams will work together to identify literacy connections that are introduced in the ELA block that can be reinforced in the social studies block. We will need to provide professional learning to teachers on how to seamlessly interweave the literacy connections in their lessons. Internally, OSIP will collaborate with the equity team on our professional development and also with external experts such as the Maryland Council on Economic Education, National Museum of African American History and Culture, Montgomery History, Montgomery Heritage, and Maryland Humanities Council. Next slide, please. Once again, we are seeking the board's approval to move forward with the grades four and five frameworks for full development to be implemented for the 2023-2024 school year. Next slide. And now, I would love to hear any comments you have and answer any of your questions. I wanna thank you for the presentation. I have one question. Yes. On page, on slide number six, <coughs> under history, you show an expansion of African American history. Yes. But then when you go to professional development, you talk about other marginalized groups. So I was wondering why they weren't mentioned there, why it was just singled out. So in the, the MS yeah. So in the MSDE frameworks, mm -hmm. they have and we've tried to mirror the MSDE frameworks. They have incorporated a lot more African American history. What we're doing in our frameworks and we're looking at the indicators and identifying how can we then expand them, even if they do not include specific ethnic groups um, in them, how can we then include or create lessons for them? Okay. That's, what, that's what we're having to do, is to identify those areas that we can broaden the curriculum. Okay, so you're saying that was the MSDE standard and then your standard is more expansive. I got it. The content will be I got more it. expanded. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Sylvester? Um, yeah, so what, we, we welcome the change, of course, it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, what prompted the change? One, it was, it was an old curriculum, and mm -hmm. we're, the state is required to revise its curriculum. Um, what is it, I think maybe every five don't hold me to that, but there's a cycle for, re, for curriculum revisions, so that's, it, that's really what's prompted it. Okay, and is that happening at the secondary level as well? <clears throat> We are constantly, coming? currently the state is revising its grade six and seven curricula. Okay, great. Because we hear from like mm -hmm. the student today about we need more, we need more, we need more. And, and we've so revised our U.S. History 8 and U.S. History 9 curricula within the last few years. Right. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. And just wanted to say, yes, uh, social studies is wonderful. It was my favorite uh, <laughs> subject in, in school. And I got hooked in middle school and it was the only classes that I took AP courses in, and of course that's a very meaningful thing I think, to experience as a high school student. So just a little shout out to social studies. Um, you mentioned some external groups yes. that help drive the standards. Could you help me understand what role they play? Or the, the external things that are influencing the, the frameworks? I'm looking at the memo here. Um, there were a couple of groups, uh, the financial literacy group, the Council on Economic oh, Education. Those, yes, those are going to be, so for instance, when we're ready to, put, to um, plan the professional learning for teachers, we will be collaborating with them to help us to plan that, that um, professional learning. Okay. We also, I will say, however, the Maryland Council on Economic Education, we collaborated with them to create the draft of the, because we're drafting the other frameworks as well, the, the um, unit in grade three on financial literacy. Okay. So they're more advisors. Correct. Okay. Great. Yes. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Dr. Daka. Yeah, I had the uh, 
the same concern for history in slide six, but you've explained that. What I'm happy about, and I think I mentioned it earlier, was that it's, it's expansion of African American history rather than slavery, because that's, that's all we've ever talked about in the past, as if there were no other history. And I know that you asked about um, um, stakeholders, community state, stakeholders, and who are they? It says Labor Management Collaboration Committee Community Stakeholders. Yeah, so the community stakeholder groups um, are our action groups that we have, and as well as reaching out to MCCPTA, reaching out to NAACP Identity, as well as other, the, the CAA. So um, we're trying to use some of the groups that have partnerships or we've, we work with regularly. And I, I had another, uh, I read, I'm almost finished. <laughs> um, I'm glad that you've included perspectives of historically marginalized groups. I have been after Ms. Hazel for two years. Mm -hmm. When are you going to tell me when they teach about Chinese Americans and the Railroad and the Exclusion Act and Absolutely. internment of Japanese and internment of Germans in Pennsylvania? Uh, these are things that don't, we don't seem to know about. Eastern Europeans, how Jewish people were given IQ tests mm -hmm. at Ellis Island. You know, these are the kinds of things I think, things that I think are important for students so they have a full picture yeah. of what we're doing. And I, I, I will actually say too, um, so let's say, so when we say historically marginalized groups, and when I, I said that the MSDE framework, if we've copied that indicator, it may not exclusively call out, it may not call that group out. So let's take East Asians as an example. So not only do we have the um, westward expansion and the railroads, but we also then pull in the Chinese Exclusion Act, then we also pull in the Japanese imprisonment camps, and then we also then pull in the COVID-19 um, hate crime act to show, and then to talk about what was going on in the past, how do we see the manifestations of some of these things in, in the present, how do people respond to them, it's that, that interaction, so yes. But it's not called out exclusively there. No, I just want them mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're trying, to, my, the, the goal is that students should be able to see themselves in the curriculum. Mm -hmm. And if something is not specifically stated, then an indicator or a, a lesson should be crafted in a way, or there are multiple opportunities, in which students should be able to use inquiry, the processes and skills, a project, project-based learning, that if whatever they, what they don't see and what they want to learn about, they're able to be able to do that in that social studies lesson. So if there's not an indicator, they have opportunity to learn about their history and then to um, educate their peers as well on it. So that, that's, that's the goal. Ms. Evans. Sure, I'm so excited about the changes, thank you. Um, we have had um, students come before the board as well as um, parents sending email about um, changes to our curriculum and social studies, but I'm glad to see that we're doing it in elementary, particularly around helping our students to focus on being able to advocate, right? Environmental literacy, um, I love that we're embedding financial literacy at the third grade level. So I think you answered my question. I was gonna ask what what type of supports will we provide for teachers if in the, I know we're gonna provide them professional development, but if in the moment something should arise, how could they get that support? Is there something they can go to? to, you know, how, how we've had, you know, different issues happen and in, um, in our world, current events. And if in fact they can't um, draw or pull up on their own knowledge, there's something that they can go to to help them to be able to support the students in the classroom. So what we're planning right now, and actually um, some, more, some of this professional learning is in the works right now. We were able to hire teachers this year to create modules on um, American slavery that will there they would be voluntary they're just if they want to start learning now they can start learning now and it's like a four part four part module four different modules on it we are also um, have some teachers working this summer on creating a um, CPD course on the history of slavery in the United States so teachers will be able to have more in-depth learning on that we'll be um, working with Montgomery Heritage 
who will help to coordinate field trips during um, professional learning in the summer for, historic, for um, historically black sites in Montgomery County. And then additionally, um, we, we, I plan to see if we can hire teachers, especially secondary teachers, because we've been partnering secondary teachers, high school teachers, with elementary teachers. The secondary teachers have the, the content knowledge, the, set, the elementary teachers with the pedago pedagogical knowledge to then cra um, craft PD as well as like in the framework, we will hyperlink links to quick videos, links to text that will give background knowledge. So my goal is to have multiple opportunities for teachers to be able to develop their learning because this is going to be a big lift for me. Absolutely. Very good. Thank you for sharing that. And I just wanted to add on uh, Ms. Evans to what Ms. Oliver Gary said. We're also here and willing to, to support. We've had mm -hmm. teachers and administrators reach out to us um, for support throughout the year. We certainly continue to welcome that and we welcome, you know, going into classrooms to support, observe, provide feedback and also to co-teach right along with the teachers and so that, that will continue. Thank you. I have a follow-up question. Is there a communication plan to share this with the community so they understand the changes being re required by um, MSDE and what we're planning to do? Absolutely. That's going to have to be a really big part of this whole process is working with our fabulous communications team um, to ensure that this is, is clearly communicated. They understand what the changes are, um, how that will manifest in the classroom and how we're going to be supporting teachers. So that's a part of the plan. When, when should we look for that? I say in the um, fall before the rollout for sure <laughs> so yeah, that's definitely in yes, advance definitely. In, 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 uh, fall or spring but um definitely before it rolls out okay miss Oluni. yes i really want to thank you both um for your emphasis on inclusion and diversity um i remember in my ap u.s history class which of course is not a curriculum that we design um, I'm Japanese American and the most we ever talked about internment was one bullet point on one slideshow. By the way, an entire generation was <laughs> placed in internment camps. All right, moving on. Um, and that's a concern and, and that uh, has a real effect on how students view their own identity and, and move forward and progress in the world. So thank you for that. I wanted to ask um, for just a little bit more uh, background and an explanation, a vision on how um, the student feedback sessions are mm -hmm. going to be designed and what that's going to look like. Um, grades three to five, that's, that's an interesting age group to work with, but I think an important part of learning is um, not just accepting the content that's taught at you, but a higher level, the metacognition of why do we learn what we learn and what narratives are missing. Um, so I'd love to just hear a little bit more about your vision for what that will look like. So we um, definitely need to include the students in it. So I'll, I'll say that part, and I admit that that feedback students were not included in that second feedback session in that. However, um, in the fall, we definitely can have student feedback sessions. And I think, too, I think that third through fifth graders will be able to look at this and be able to see things that they want or point out things as well. So we definitely will use our social studies representatives to try to create, coordinate those focus groups as well at their schools. So, but what we did with the focus groups, we created a process. We had the same questions and they recorded their responses to them and then they submitted it to us. Because we wanted to open it up to all schools to be able to participate so instead of just a few here or there. So we will do the same process in the fall. Mm -hmm. Ms. Spandrowski. So I too want to thank you for your work on this. Um, I really, I really like, you know, the questions and things that I was reading about. Um, I just have one quick question in terms of um, elementary school students, they, do they receive health class or no? I'm curious about how some issues such as uh, addressing the LGBTQ communities and things like that and all of, is, is that incorporated in here? Because I didn't see anything about right. that, so that versus health. I can't answer the health question. However, let's say LGBTQ plus history will also be, it's going to be included in our curriculum that we, how we're tailoring the, um, those indicators that may not call out. Okay. So we are interweaving it in the history. Oh, 
I appreciate that. And we do have health, health we do. lessons I, as well. They're not associated yeah. with the social studies. <laughs> so I don't want to put her on the spot. We no, do I have uh, health lessons as well that our classroom teachers in elementary school okay. are expected to teach, but it's not year long. There, there's certain units throughout the year. Right. Okay. Great. Thank you. Lynn, go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you for this all presentation and the really appreciate the questions that my colleagues, the board have been asking. Um, and I just wanted to pick up on something that you said earlier, which was, you know, social studies is, it, this is, is literacy, but I would also put out that I think social studies, that's also life skills. When you're talking about teaching, you know, embedding in the curriculum at very early ages, advocacy skills and financial literacy and environmental literacy, that that's life skills. Those are the things that our students need to be thinking critically about, at, you know, it, it, at very young ages so that they're really ready to step out into the world and lead um, and be kind of the influencers and change makers that our students are so good at being. Um, um, and, but I had a question. So th this, I think, conceptually sounds amazing. And I, I very much like what you already said about, you know, we're really focused on learning through inquiry, which instead of very didactic telling you, but very, um, much more um, critical thinking about helping you ask questions about what the information you're being presented and how you contextualize it and look at it through your own experience and not just sort of accept things as they're presented to you. Um, we've heard so much from teachers for years and, and definitely this year has been no different about how they feel like some of the curriculum that we purchase and, and that we implement in our school system, boxes them in and doesn't give them a lot of room to bring their own individuality into the classroom, their own talents and, and passions. And um, is, do you see this curriculum as something that gives instructors, the teachers, more freedom to um, really bring the, their, you know, who they are as teachers into the classroom and sort of you know, delivering the the lessons and the and the materials, but also um, in in a more creative way. So I'll say we we don't know what the curriculum will be, what those lessons will be um, like right now because we haven't purchased anything. However, the intent is that teachers should be able to use their expertise in crafting lessons, using the indicators, and whatever topics those key topics that they're supposed to teach within those indicators, that those are done. Um, and so, for example, at the secondary level, I will go with the secondary level. We have a curriculum. We have lesson plans that we put out to teachers. Some teachers teach those lesson plans with fidelity. Some teachers say, you know, this one, this is not quite me. I'm using these documents. I'm using this. I'm teaching the indicator with the key topics. I will teach everything that students are supposed to learn. But I'm crafting a lesson around um, the way I would I feel comfortable teaching it, um, and that meets the standard, that meets the expectations. That is that is the goal. Let me just say that without hopefully lecturing. Yes, that, that would be that would be the goal. But using inquiry. And and, I, and so can I plan. add? Um, we certainly expect our teachers to, to teach to, to the standards and to use the indicators and scope mm -hmm. and sequence throughout the year. Um, certainly we welcome teachers to be able to tailor lessons to meet the needs of their, their students. In social studies, it's, it's um, interesting because we are dealing with aspects of history and race, and we want to make sure that what is being taught is accurate and that there is a level of sensitivity to it. So the training is going to be important, and we want teachers to stay as close to what we have provided them as possible. So we, there's, it's a fine line. We want them to have that, that opportunity to use their professional judgment. But we also sometimes, when we get the question, when you all get the questions from the board office uh, about lessons, sometimes we've never seen them before. And we want to make sure that that training is there and, and our teachers really understand um, what they're teaching, that, that it's accurate, and that it's really um, being sensitive to our students. 
And I guess that goes to are we, you know, the as we go through the, the curriculum selection process, making sure. And I think, you know, in some conversations I've had, our new uh, chief academic officer seems to have some real strengths in this way of valuing what the teachers bring into the classroom and and the, their individual talents and energies, and you know, doing less telling and maybe more asking of teachers about what works and what creates really exciting, fun classroom experiences for students because. You know, I mean, I think one of the things that is essential for learning to be, you know, as, you know, potent as it can be is that learning has to be fun and engaging. And so I think teachers, you know, we want to make sure that we, we have a curriculum that's strong and inclusive and, and, and accurate, but doesn't make teachers feel like they have to robotically just march through it without being able to bring their own individuality and humor and everything into the classroom. Are we, you know, when we create, you know, when we start looking at the curriculum and we're going to have a robust team of educators, you know, this, this age, you know, early child educators, you know, elementary school educators helping to look at the curriculum to see how, um, how, to look at how it can be delivered in a classroom to really make it engaging and fun for the students. Ms. Evans. President, if I can just add, I just wanted to, I, I feel like what um, Ms. Hazel said is correct and what Mrs. Oliver Gary said is correct as well. And I'm gonna use a teacher as an example of who I think is an example of what, who Ms. Harris is speaking to. And that would, for me, that would be, um, Mr. Michael Williams, he taught at John F. Kennedy High School Social Studies, right? He was our teacher of the year. So I do think that for those teachers that know um, the work and um, it will be accurate and um, be sensitive to the students' needs that they are able to put themselves, you know, like do what they need to do to have some flexibility to bring um, some of who they are to the work. So I just wanted to give an example because we do have people like that in our system that can do what you're talking about, Ms. Harris. So I don't have any concerns about um, teachers and their strengths and who will go that distance because they know they can and they know the work. Okay, thank you. At this time, we have on the agenda a recess, but I'm gonna ask Dr. McKnight, is her staff here to do the ECA policy? Uh, okay. Yes, they are here. Um, I, I'm sorry, they did want to have a vote. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, supporting you. <laughs> yes, go ahead. That's right. We need a, um, a, a motion on the recommendation. Move approval. Second. Is there any further discussion? All in favor, raise your hand. That is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Um, President Wolf, I just wanted to thank the team again for this work, it does make a difference when we start this with our students who are in, at the elementary level to become much more self-aware than they ever have through the lens of social studies. So I just wanna thank you for that. I see Ms. Ani over there in the back. I wanna thank you for your years and time and influence in this work as well. So appreciate it. Miss you. Okay. So the board has indicated that, um, no, no, no. The board has indicated at this time that they would like to keep going, so I need a motion to revise the agenda to eliminate recess. Uh, move to revise the agenda. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. That is unanimous. We're now up to item number eight. Dr. McKnight, I'll ask you to proceed. Oh, Ms. Madrowski. Would you like to, to sure. do this? I didn't, I didn't know if we were waiting for them to join the table. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I almost forgot my microphone. So um, welcome to the table. I want to um, start off, you know, we're getting ready to talk about policy ECA, um, energy conservation, and I just want to start off by saying um, thank you so much for your work on this policy. Um, I think personally it's something we can all be really proud of. Um, I think it really highlights our commitment um, to and our vision for what this school system 
should be doing. Um, and I know it took a lot of hard work on all of your parts. Um, I particularly want to uh, thank Mr. Adams, um, Director of Facilities Management, and his team and the Office of the General Counsel staff um, for facilitating the changes and collecting the public feedback, of which there's significant amount of. Um, and you know we always appreciate all of your efforts. So um, this proposed policy essentially includes three major areas of revision. Uh, we're proposing a title change from energy conservation to sustainability to better reflect our commitment. Uh, the proposed policy reflects our responsibilities in the area of environmental literacy and sustainability as set forth in the Code of the Maryland Regulations and the Montgomery County Climate Action Plan. It also addresses Maryland in initiatives to increase the number of green schools in the state of Maryland and the requirement to update its energy policy by July 1st, 2022, just under the wire. <laughs> um, we reviewed the policy as a full board in January and we took tentative action on it, sent it out for public comment. And today you all are here to review those public comments and take us to um, through cha any changes, so we may take final action on the policy. So with that, I will turn it over to you all. Okay, thank you. So this afternoon, we are here to discuss public comments. Mm -hmm. And joining me today is Mrs. Zarate from the Division of Sustainability and Mr. Adams from Department of Facilities Management. So in a moment, uh, Mrs. Zarate will give you some more information about the public engagement, which began well in advance of the public comment period. In fact, um, there was work going back to winter of 2021. Um, and I you have the public engagement <laughs> summary in front of you. She has set the bar quite yeah. high. <laughs> yes, agreed. <laughs> so let me summarize some of the public comments since the board took tentative action on February 8th. So it was out from public comment from February 8th to April 7th. We provided comments in the summary of those comments, but just to give you an overview, there were 99 comments that came through the public comment page, plus additional comments that went to board members. It was general approval of the policy supporting efforts to reduce greenhouse gases, increase the use of renewable energy, and increase climate change education, um, along with recommendations to consider total cost to reference student participation at the local school level, um, and, and comments uh, to re reduce food waste. Um, additional comments were received after the public comment period, um, including those first from some students who directed their comments at Dr. Joftis um, and referenced a petition. I, I checked the petition this morning. They were up to 594. Uh, signatures um, and the petition called for um, such things as buying only renewable electricity uh, electrifying all buildings um, and demanding state money to retrofit old ones installing solar panels increasing energy efficiency and providing good jobs to low-income Montgomery County community members in all construction work um, I let's see I can show you a little later how those comments are reflected in the document, but for now, let me turn to Mrs. Zarate. Thank you. During our community engagement period, we met with over a thousand community members. We were working to build a network of collaborators because the work is just beginning with this policy. We need to do a lot of work after the policy should be approved. We found a high level of approval in those public comments for the work that we were doing. The big takeaway in meeting with many of the stakeholders, though, was that many of them did not even know some of the work that MCPS has already undertaken in this area. So we know that we need to do much more community outreach and conversation with everyone about the work that we're doing. In addition, we wanted to make sure that we included education on the topic, both for staff and for students, as well as highlighting individual school efforts and individual efforts of various students. As um, Ms. Davis mentioned, sustainability is the proposed new title. We felt that it shouldn't be called just environmental sustainability because it wasn't just about environmental work, it wasn't just about energy conservation, it was really about a culture change to address climate change and to address the student member of the board's concerns about that this is a problem that's happening now and we need to make sure it's sustainable for the future. Last but not least, we um, wanted to make sure that it was a responsible 
policy. You know, we're not just throwing away things um, that are still useful, and we're we're taking into consideration that we do need to reduce our greenhouse gas uh, emissions very quickly, um, but that we need to do it in a strategic fashion, and that will require effort across many fronts simultaneously. Um, we've already begun work this year to increase our solar production, to look at new ways of having solar production, things like solar canopies and off-site production. We are also looking at um, energy audits for our buildings to do what we can to reduce that consumption, because that's going to be one of the most beneficial things that we can do moving forward is reducing that energy consumption. Excuse in me, light. could you talk a little louder? Please? I'm sorry. Thank reducing our energy consumption in light of the rising fuel prices that are out there right now. It's going to be so critical moving forward. Um, and last but not least, um, we need to make sure that we um, are electrifying our schools, and we've been working on a concerted effort with the Division of Design and Construction to electrify as much as possible moving forward, while at the same time reducing that energy use of the buildings. I'll turn it over to Mr. Adams now. So, so thank you. So um, the next part of this is talking about the implementation. So, so we're here today to talk about the policy, the foundation of the work uh, that, that sets sets the vision for where we, we meet and we, we work alongside the county climate action plan. It's a very aggressive plan, as we've talked about before. So um, a significant reduction in greenhouse gases in the next five years, 100% reduction by 2035. So as we think about implementation, uh, that is a, a significant amount of work that, that comes from the public comments. That will be the work of our regulation. That will be the work of strategic planning. Um, you know, I also think about this a little bit in terms of this is going to be a recalibration for us from both capital budgeting for both operating budgeting. It's a recalibration of expectations for communities, for schools. Um, it's a recalibration of partnerships with local planning departments. And I say that because this, this reduction in greenhouse gases involves everything that we do, everything we do from a, from a daily operations. It's not just new construction. It's the way we think about our transportation. It's the way we, we ultimately would think about boundaries in the future, how, how that fits within the public uh, transportation, bicycle, pedestrian uh, access network. It's the way we think about our, our fields, our athletic fields. You know, we, we see emails about the grass is too long. That, that will become the norm, you know, turning, restoring the, the public space into natural space as part of the overall climate initiatives. You, you think about, you know, the watershed. You know, we do a tremendous amount of work with, with different aspects of, of um, bioretention and other functions, but we don't do nearly enough to meet the goals and ambitions of this plan. So I, I say this because the implementation is going to be extremely important. Implementation is going to involve uh, not only annual updates, it's going to involve constant updates. So, so as we talk about what that looks like, you know, having a robust website so that when students are involved in an initiative at an individual school, they can see how it impacts the plan and gain momentum and continue that momentum forward. So, so we're very excited about this. Um, we're excited that the, the board is, is, is committed to this work. We're excited the county executive put this forward as an aggressive plan. We do think it's aggressive, but we think truly if, if this becomes part of our norm uh, that we can achieve this and we can start to, to set the environmental standards that are necessary to, to leave this place a better place for, for our current students and those students that follow behind. So, so with that, um, I do turn it back over to Sally to talk through a few more items and certainly open up to questions after that. Okay, so let me take you through some of the changes to the policy in response to public comments. If we can begin on page three. Um, I want to draw your attention to a comment that we heard uh, repeatedly through the comments, which especially in the comments we received uh, kind of towards the end, was um, seeking more local school and student involvement in this effort. So you'll notice uh, right around line 67, 68, Montgomery County Board of Education collaborates with federal, state, and local partners and seeks the active participation of local school communities in comprehensive efforts to solve regional problems. And then the sentence goes on from there. If I can take you to the next page, page five. We did hear um, a couple comments about waste and particularly food waste. And so the stem begins, I'm, I'm citing the, the text at 
111, but it, the stem begins the page previously, the board is committed to innovative and system-wide sustainability to include using waste reduction and greenhouse gases emissions as criteria in decisions related to purchasing, including but not limited to energy, transportation, food services, and other operational areas. Okay, on the next line, um, we picked up that theme again at line 161. MCPS implements operational practices and programs that achieve measurable reductions in greenhouse gases and waste that align with Montgomery County Climate Action Plan's greenhouse gas reduction targets. All right, let me take you to the next page, to page 8. Lines 187 and 188. Here was another opportunity for us to emphasize local school. Um, I'll just begin this sentence before. Develop processes to establish and foster organizational culture and operational procedures that foster creativity and collaboration and innovation across departments and at the local school level to implement systemic climate solutions. Um, sections B and C we didn't remove text as much as rearrange them. We wanted to split to apart these two ideas, one to focus on understanding and the second to focus on active engagement. So um, the first one, infuse sustainability concepts across school curricula and professional development to allow students and staff to gain an understanding of individual, collective, and societal responses to human-induced environmental change. And then the second part, provide opportunities for students and staff to engage in actions that contribute to climate solutions. And then the sentence moves on from there. Uh, let's see, let's move over to nine, uh, page nine, line 229. The stem begins, the superintendent of schools designee will identify actions that can be taken immediately and long term, and then I'm going to jump over, to develop and implement behavior-based sustainability programs at local schools. Uh, including strategies to support and increase the number of Maryland certified green schools and other programs. Um, and then I believe we discussed this edit before, but um, replace MCPS diesel and gasoline vehicles as appropriate with electric, hybrid, or other more efficient or clean, cleaner fuel vehicles. I did notice one of our uh, commenters asked us to remove that part. And the reason we left it in was because we want to leave ourselves open for innovations coming down the line of technologies we do not yet anticipate. So we wanted to leave that open. And I will stop there. We are ready for your discussion. So thank you. Um, I will open it up to my colleagues. Um, did you have something you wanted to? No, no, no. I was just filling oh. in for Ms. Wolf. Oh, OK. Here, Sorry. So I was going to say, um, Ms. Oluni. Yeah, I just wanted to thank this team. We've spent a lot of time together this past year, those of us on the policy committee. Um, and it's been really awesome to watch the enthusiasm that you have for this work um, and the vision that I can see that you have for the future of the school system. Um, but I think the importance of putting together a document like this and the reason that I personally pushed so hard for that numerical target, aligning ourselves with the county's carbon emission reduction plan, um, is because while there may be this passion and fire underneath us right now, um, who knows about future generations. So the importance of codifying it in a document like this. But particularly, Mr. Adams, thank you so much for highlighting the gravity of mm -hmm. what we're doing here. Like, this is a yes. really big deal. Mm -hmm. um, and it's going to, I think, be a real trust exercise between MCPS and our community. Uh, when we create a lofty goal like this, and we say and come out very publicly holding ourselves to it, do we stick to it? And I think that's going to require commitment, not just from this department, not just from legal, not just from the board, but every member of our community yes. um, and every department and, and every aspect of the work that we do in educating students. But I'm very excited. And, and thank you so much for all of the hard work that has gone into this. Yeah. I, too, want to say thank you for putting in a little bit of bigger perspective um, and picture the impacts of this and, and the um, purpose of why we're trying to be so um, aggressive, if you will, um, about it. And I do want to just say thank you again for all of your work because it was very, very intensive and um, 
we are grateful. I think, like I said, I'm very proud of this policy. Hopefully the board as a whole is excited about it and, mm -hmm. and proud of it. Dr. Daka? Oh, I just, I'm excited about it when you talk about sustainability and especially when you said people don't know all the things right. that we've done. Mm -hmm. So I'm really glad that when you bring forward buildings now, you do the whole sustainability part because people need to know what we're doing to economize and to take care of the um, environment. Yes, I agree with that. So, oh, Ms. Um, Harris, please. Yeah, um, I, I too share the um, appreciation of my board colleagues for all of the work and um, the substance that's represented in this policy. And in particular, um, well, first of all, I appreciate um, Mr. Adams for always being so um, very objective and pragmatic. Um, and you know this is going to be hard, and we have. But we have. We're, if we're going to commit to it, when it gets hard, we just have to keep it. We just have to keep pushing forward, um, because this is, as our students are telling us very, very, very loudly, this is the future. That you know, maybe some of us at this table, I, you know, won't be around nearly as long as the students who who are seeing very clearly what needs to happen to create a safe and sustainable future. Um, but I, I really appreciate the responsiveness because I've read through all of the public comments and I very much appreciate, um, although perhaps we didn't en enunciate specifically some of the work that our students have been doing in our schools, like the, the consumer, like the, the composting work of the compostology students and the, and the capital compost students. What you've done is to say we are very open and intentional around innovation and, and creative climate solutions. And, um, you know, kind of infusing the, you know, ongoing, you know, technology and ongoing work and maybe even technology we, we don't even envision right now into this policy and the future of the system. And uh, so I really, um, really appreciate that that piece of this as well. Um, and I guess one kind of baseline question is that the sustainability policy very directly and explicitly envisions um, the infusion of, of um, sustainability concepts throughout the curriculum. And this sort of ties into the presentation we just had around elementary social studies curriculum, which very directly said, you know, environmental literacy concepts will be built in. And so do we have a vision for, you know, the, the sustainability team in the facilities team sort of uh, partnering a bit with our curriculum folks when we look at how the work of the system, you know, 360 degrees can um, support this vision of, you know, incorporating these, these, these concepts of sustainability into the, the classroom as well as the work of, and the operations of the system. That's a very good question, and absolutely. Mm -hmm. Ever since we began our first uh, public outreach back in May of last year, um, we met with the Office of Curriculum and Instruction to co-develop the presentations and to both partner with them in developing content, but also to talk about the curriculum and to talk about the improvements that need to be made. The County Climate Action Plan actually has a very heavy educational component to it and assigns a lot of those responsibilities to MCPS. It's actually more heavily focused on the education piece than specifically on the facilities piece. So we've been partnering with them from the beginning and we talk probably weekly about various issues with this and we'll continue to do so moving forward and, and they will be a very active partner moving forward. Thank you. Just so much appreciate this work. Yeah, thank you. And I also very much look forward to hearing how it's going to be, you know, incorporated into new projects and things like that. And um, not just new projects, actually, but the repairs and things like that as we go forward. So um, do any of my colleagues have anything else that they wouldn't to say or add or questions? No? Okay. Well, then I will um, move this forward um, from the policy committee and just read the Resolve, if that's okay. Um, be it resolved that the Board of Education adopt board policy ECA sustainability as updated in the attached response to public comments. Um, I don't need a second, but all in favor? That is unanimous. Yeah. That is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Um, are there people here for the charter school? All right, we're now up to item number nine. I'll ask Dr. McKnight to proceed. Hey, thank you so much. Um, Ms. Hazel is joining us at the table. 
um, and we are giving a presentation on charter schools and the MECCA charter school application. Today we have a presentation on charter schools that includes one applicant for a public charter school in Montgomery County. Every year, public schools are required to implement a process for charter school applicants to be able to submit proposals to be reviewed. Applications are made available to the public and technical assistance is provided to all applicants who have a desire and express a desire to be supported through the process. Um, charter school applications must be submitted by the first business day in the month of April. So that's a consistent timeline that we've always adhered to um, to make sure that we are engaging appropriately. This year, as in previous years, MCPS assembled an internal and external team, and this team consists of staff from all different parts of the system, operations, curriculum instruction, finance offices, as well as parents, guardians, and uh, those representing our employee associations. Panel members review the charter school application together, and if you remember from our past procedures, this is exactly what we've done. They review the application together, and then they participate in an uh, interview process with the applicant. Um, the purpose of today's meeting is to learn more about the charter school proposal and to ask questions. There will be no decision made today during our meeting about, um, the, about the actual charter. We will return in July for you to consider a decision about the future of the proposed charter school that we will hear about today. Annually, as per the Board of Education Policy, CFB, public charter schools, the superintendent has a responsibility to administer a charter school review process. I have reviewed the process and believe it is appropriate and aligned with the policy. So with that, I'll turn it over to Cecil. All right. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, President Wolf, Dr. McKnight, and members of the board. I'm sitting off to the side because most of our presentation is virtual today. And uh, so you'll be hearing from our, our charter school in, in just a moment, um, the applicant in just a moment. So um, the charter school that we will be hearing from today is the MBEF College and Career Academies, Inc., or Mecca Business Learning Institute, or MBLI. Uh, and so they are coming to us today to share with us information about um, their school. The uh, charter school did apply, as Dr. McKnight said, and there are just a few components that we just want to highlight in the application that they needed to speak to in their written application and also through their interview. So executive components, meaning their, their vision and their mission, and how they're going to address the needs of our students, academic programming, including curriculum assessment, their instructional materials, their governance requirements, uh, including how they're going to monitor um, their program and ensure that their students and their staff are, are meeting um, the expectations and complying to all of the laws and regulations. There are facilities uh, and finance requirements that they had to include in the application, so they had to show how they would attain funding um, and also um, speak to their facility, procurement, and uh, any fiscal uh, questions, and then operations, uh, including student enrollment, monitoring, uh, staff, professional development, things of that nature. So uh, today, we're going to first hear from Dr. Kenneth Marcus. He is a retired MCPS principal. This is his second year as our charter school liaison. And he is the one that um, met with all of our stakeholders and had them to review the process. And he's going to just share some highlights of the school um, that led to our recommendation. And then we will hear from the school uh, itself. So here's Dr. Marcus. Good evening, everyone. Uh, the first slide I'm going to go over is to talk about process. In this slide, I re re will review the charter school process, which began on April 1st, when MBLI submitted their application. Once received, we first reviewed it for technical completion and then submitted it to a review panel. The review panel, um, the, re the panel reviewed the application according to the corresponding rubric and submitted concerns and questions to the applicant. Dr. The Marcus, complaint? if you can hold yes. for one moment, we're gonna ask if we can put the slides up. Sure. And if you can speak up just a bit. Sure. I have a headset on, so okay, is that one better? Keep going, yes. Uh, if you can go to the next, there we go. Thank you. Okay. Uh, 
So I'll just start quickly over. Uh, and Dr. McKnight did a great job of giving an, a timeline also. So in this slide, I'm just going to review the charter school process, which began on April 1st when MBLI submitted their application. Once received, we first reviewed it for technical completion and then completed it, then submitted it to a review panel. The review panel reviewed the application according to a corresponding rubric and submitted concerns and questions to the applicant. At a capacity interview on May 25th, the applicant responded to those concerns and questions. This evening, the applicant will present to the board and the, super, and the superintendent will share a recommendation. The board will announce the final decision on July 26th. And we'll go to the next slide. The, panel, the review panel identified strengths and areas of concerns, which were shared with MBLI prior to this presentation. Areas of strength include that the applicant has received a 900,000 startup grant from MSDE, and a portion will be used for a start up to start up the facility for the facility cost. The applicant also has a clear mission and plans to utilize research-based instructional standards and tests and their gradual six-year enrollment rollout plan. As you see on the slide in the memo, there are also areas of concern. MBLI has addressed several of these areas, including making budget adjustments, and you will hear in their presentation this evening how they have been addressed. We'll go to the next slide. So for collaboration and recommendations, should the MBLI application be accepted, MBLI, MCPS has identified several areas where collaboration to meet the needs of our students is desired. These include ensuring transportation services meet regulations and meeting the needs of students with disabilities and emergent multilingual learners and ongoing consultation on budget requirements aligned to actual student enrollment. And so for the next slide, I'd like to introduce Ms. LaShondra Graham, who will introduce MBLI representatives and share more about the proposal for the MECCA Business Institute. Thank you, Dr. Marcus. Can we share our screen? Is that permissible? We have the uh, slides already ready to share for you. Okay, okay. <laughs> Thank you. So we will be. So we'll just, I guess, indicate next slide. Is that is that yes. how you like for us to do? Okay. Very well. Okay. So with that being said, greetings, uh, Board Chair Wolf, Board of Education members, inter interim superintendent Dr. McKnight and MCPS staff, including especially Nikki Hazel and Dr. Marcus. Today's presentation is an overview of the Mecca Business Learning Institute, or what we affectionately now call MBLI, a proposed public charter school, and will highlight MBLI's design, financial resources, and community support. Presenting today are myself, LaShondra Graham, one of the founders, Tracy Cooper, the other founder, and joining us also are our board chair, Nikisha Shell, and Skylar Cooper, the senior lead of our school design team. Next slide, please. The MBF College and Career Academies, what we call MECA, the parent organization of MBLI is a Maryland registered nonprofit, non-sectarian corporation with IRS 501c3 designation. Composed of high capacity and experienced professionals, the collective 28 member group, which includes the founders, Tracy and myself, board of trustees, both founding and candidates, design team and design advisors, possess the expertise appropriate to establish and operate a successful charter school. Next slide. MBLI is designed as a college preparatory and vocational school for students in grades six through 12 with a business education theme. The design goal is to encourage students to, to pursue collegiate business studies and inspire them to be future stewards of the business community. MBLI plans to open with students in grades six and seven with annual grade expansions through high school grade 12. Next slide, please. 
MBLI's academic program is research-based, incorporates college and career readiness standards, and infuses the diverse perspectives of cultures, races, genders, and the experiences of marginalized people to ensure equity. The curriculum is categorized as core, MCore, Encore, Flex, and Service Learning. MBLI's core curriculum is based on national and state standards for English, mathematics, social science, and science. Business is woven into the core subjects through projects and lessons to provide additional connections and real world application. MBLI's course materials, teaching methods, and learning activities are modified to accommodate a diverse group of students with a range of abilities, experiences, and needs. Next slide, please. MBLI's core MCore curriculum is based on national standards developed by the Department of Education, National Career Academy Coalition, and National Business Education Association. MCore program provides students with opportunities to gain insight on business theory and leadership, marketing and entrepreneurship with an emphasis on financial literacy skills and guidance on planning for the future. There are a number of program features that will offer students with unique business experiences, including the microeconomy or MTE, our annual business symposiums, and connections to business mentors and internships. These experiences will help students connect the academic and theoretical business studies with practical application. Next slide, please. <clears throat> MBLI's Encore program encourages students to explore their current passions and develop new interests and abilities that are outside of our business learning. MBLI's Encore program is standards-based and includes foreign language, communication, typing and technology, physical education and health, art and music that also includes band and chorus. Students will have opportunities to continue their exploration or develop new interests after the school day with extracurricular activities like robotics. Next slide, please. MBLI understands the dynamic nature of learning and that students may require additional experiences or assistance to help them excel. The FLEX program is designed to offer students additional support and or enrichment to aid in student success. FLEX programming blocks include advisory, intervention, enrichment, social emotional learning, and transition support as students move from elementary to middle, middle to high and beyond. Flex blocks, excuse me, flex blocks are incorporated into the student schedule and are offered during the school day. Students who may require addition, additional assistance in foundational subjects like English and math will be able to obtain um, practice opportunities through supplemental instruction. Students who may be English language learners, have an IEP or 504 will also benefit from flex courses because they will be able to provide additional assistance with organization, study skills, or content practice. While students who may be considered talented or gifted or who may not need the additional support can obtain enrichment on various topics and subjects. Next slide, please. MBLI service learning programming will progress through four stages and involves engaging students in a variety of experiences that, that will benefit others and the community. Additionally, it will help um, further the learning goals of the curriculum. Students will reflect on their impact and how to improve their community-based work. Next slide, please. MBLI intends to locate in Gaithersburg. Our initial planning efforts have identified vacant space at 700 Russell Avenue. However, after charter approval, MBLI will undergo formal steps to finalize the school's geographic location within Gaithersburg and obtain an appropriate facility. MBLI will immediately, after charter approval, engage its current partners and consultants that include real estate agents, architects, engineers, general contractors, design consultants, etc., to finalize plans and calculate actual costs, as well as prepare the facility for timely staff and student occupancy. Next slide, please. How students will get there. Yellow bus service is anticipated to be the primary source of transportation for all enrolled students to travel to and from MBLI. 
MDLI's operating and budget includes dedicated funding for both bus drivers and yellow bus leases, which will ensure MBLI is able to provide yellow bus service for all enrolled students. Next slide, please. MBLI researched best practices from financial experts at the Government Finance Offices Association, the Rennie Center, Harvard Business Review, the Maryland State Department of Education, the Maryland Alliance for Public Charter Schools, and a variety of additional reputable sources for financing education to craft a budget within projected resources. MBLI's budget model and financial plan ensure that MBLI's educational program will be able to operate exclusively with public, with public funds. Conservative budgeting will allow MBLI to maintain financial stability in the operating budget using the MCPS per pupil allocation and does account for the MCPS administrative allowance of 2%. MBLI's budget breakdown on the screen includes the following, salaries and benefits, direct school, occupancy, and general and administration. Each budget category also includes a contingency to compensate for the uncertainty and inherent in cost and time estimates, as well as unpredictable risk exposure. These budget allocations also assume student attrition and conservative revenue, yet allow MBLI to balance the budget. All expenses will be managed in the context of MBLI's mission. Next slide, please. MBLI anticipates leveraging a startup grant from the Maryland State Department of Education and the attainment of private funding to support facilities renovations and or necessary facilities acquisitions. MBLI's board of directors will, with short and long-term long operational plans in mind, determine which route MBLI will pursue in seeking private funding, including, for example, loans, lines of credit, government bonds, et cetera. After opening, MBLI anticipates receiving per pupil funds from MCPS to support ongoing facilities management operations and general maintenance. Next slide, please. The space that MBLI has initially located is, as Tracy mentioned, on 700 Russell Avenue. MBLI intends to lease this property and will work with the property owners, ProMark partners, to determine whether or not Promark or MBLI will be responsible for any renovations. Promark and other commercial property owners typically fund renovations of this nature by providing an improvement allowance and or providing free or abated rents. Should MBLI be responsible in whole or in part, MBLI has determined that leveraging the startup grant from MSDE, the school can afford up to 2.7 million for initial renovations. It is anticipated that the $2.7 million will be pursued through school bonds, which can be used for renovations, if not at Russell Avenue or at another facility. Next slide, please. Using facility budget best practices, MBLI aims to ensure that the facility budget is comprehensive and engages MBLI's multiple stakeholders. The budget not only places proactive maintenance at the forefront, but also includes contingencies similar to our other budget categories for unplanned expenses and emergencies. Next slide, please. Gathering support from the community has been a big part of the work to establish MBLI in Montgomery County. Between 2017 and 2022, 611 people have signed their name to our electronic letter of support. MBLI has formalized partnerships with and obtain support from 18 organizations, including the Maryland State Department of Education, the Maryland Alliance of Public Charter Schools, Arts for Learning Maryland, Junior Achievement, and most recently, Morgan State University. Community outreach, including partnerships, both virtual and in-person, will, will continue until the school launch. Next slide, please. This concludes the MBLI portion of the presentation. Thank you for the time and the attention lent to the presentation of the Mecca Business Learning Institute, a proposed public charter school for Montgomery County, Maryland. You want to? Yes, thank you. So yes, at this time, we want to see if you have any questions. 
I don't have any questions. Does anyone have any questions? Ms. Silvestri? Um, yeah, I don't know if this is a relevant question, but last time the proposal was to open a charter school in the eastern part of the county, and now it's in the Gaithersburg region of the county. Uh, I, just, I wondered what prompted the change. Did you well, hear Mecca has been doing work in and around the Montgomery County and the, and the greater Washington D metropolitan area at large. And we have purposed our work to target specific areas of need within Montgomery County. And so on our list of support needs, based on the, the students that we work with, we had uh, Tacoma Park being our sort of initial area, followed by Gaithersburg. So we had a sort of a blend of students coming from these regions. It is just that we started our work based in Tacoma Park, and then now we're looking at our other area of need, which was Gaithersburg. And then you're in your um, enrollment projections, you estimate English language learners estimated at 15.8%. Given that the Gaithersburg community has a high percentage of English language learners, I wondered mm -hmm. what you were basing that number on. Exactly. Well, we used we used the middle schools that were in the Gaithersburg community as well as the high school and looked also at the elementary schools. And we looked at the actual demographic data for the enrolled students and used an average of the uh, ratios in that space to use as a basis for our estimates. However, our numbers are just estimates. And because we are a charter school, the, st the students can actually come from across the county. They're not limited to just attending if they live in Gaithersburg. So while we use the Gaithersburg numbers as a guide, the charter school is open to students as an open boundary attendance pro uh, policy. And so students can come from across the county. And will you be providing busing for students throughout the county? Yes, yes ma'am. As Tracy Cooper mentioned as a part of our presentation, we have prepared uh, our budget to include dr drivers as well as leases for the buses so that we're able to provision yellow bus transportation for all students. Um, could I ask about the mention in the presentation about a clause about transportation that should it become uh, economically burdensome that transportation would not be provided? Is that so what that was? What that was, and we spoke to the staff about this as well. So, as charter schools, there are certain elements in the application to which charter schools are not allowed to be held to, and one of those pieces is the transportation. And charter schools have the flexibility, should their budget need to be adjusted, they have the opportunity to opt out of providing transportation until such time as they may determine at a later point within the enrollment process that they can feasibly accommodate the transportation. However, we've done the initial work to set up a, uh, a yellow bus transportation plan that we think will be able to support the enrolled students. Okay. Is that all? Dr. Lynn Gaka. Harris is on the Lynn Harris is waving her hand on the computer. I'm sorry. Oh, we Thank don't you. see we we can't see her. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Lynn Okay, now we can see you. Lynn, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, thank you. I um, uh, appreciate the presentation, and I and I also um, I appreciate um, your your proposal to do a kind of a phased in enrollment, starting your first year with grade six to seven, and then adding an additional grade, an incoming grade, you know, sixth grade class basically every year thereafter till you're fully populated, uh, which is a method, you know, a mechanism that we've used successfully in in opening schools in MCPS before. Um, one question I have though, so when you're looking at the timeline here and there are some, um, uh, you know, some flesh that needs to be put on the bones of the, of the proposal and the plan, including around facilities and transportation. And according to the timeline, um, the plan is to open for the 23, 24 school year. So students walking in the door just about August 27th or so, but the timeline doesn't require some of these details to be finalized until July of 2023. So just assume, but you know, our students at MCPS are generally making decisions about you know, what middle school they're going to go to early, early in the year, say, you know, January, February. 
So what happens if we have, you know, these, the, you know, 250 sixth and seventh graders committed in, you know, the January, February enrollment period, and then come July, something happens and, and the facilities just um, won't be ready. What will happen to those students? What's the, the mechanism for keeping committed families uh, informed as the, as the, you know, the, you know, I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. And then what's the, you know, plan B should things not actually fully come together um, in time for an August 2023 opening? Well, actually, the superintendent has recommended and our board chair and board has a, has agreed to uh, extend our opening actually to school year 25, which would actually start in fall of 2024. So we are actually going to begin the pre-operations work immediately upon charter authorization. We will start our pre-operations work now. So we technically have an additional year based on the superintendent's recommendation is to finalize that facility, whether it be a lease of the uh, facility we've identified or whether we are going to find an alternative location within Gatesburg that's not 700 Russell Avenue. So we actually have two years in a sense, an extra year to now provision the facilities piece, which we are very confident that we're uh, going to be able to do. Additionally, and to address um, uh, Ms. Harris, your comment about how are we going to keep parents informed, we anticipate communicating with parents and our public through multiple methods to keep them abreast of where we are at each phase of the process. Once we are clear and have been approved, we will provide updates in our social media pages, our website, as well as through correspondence for in interested families to um, provide again, up-to-date progress on what's happening with the school and opening and all of the great things that will be occurring. Thanks, Tracy. You're welcome. Yeah, and so it sounds like the vision, so the, the proposal right now is you're hoping for the 700 Russell Avenue location in Gaithersburg, but with opportunities for students all across the system to attend, hopefully with transportation provided, um, what is your, um, um, what is your timeline at this point, assuming approval for the charters granted for um, sharing the opportunity with families across the school system, um, you know, for those families who would have a sixth or seventh grader in the fall of 24. Well, we actually already started some of the work, which is why I mentioned the data around the elementary schools. We actually started sort of the initial discussion with the elementary schools around the fact that we were coming and conversations with them around the connections between our curriculum, what they're doing, what they're not doing. And so what we hope to be able to do is to expand that rollout to some of the additional elementary schools across the county, which then expands our reach beyond just the Gatesburg students that we've sort of been networking with most closely over the last year and a half. So I think the issue really is just going to be for us. It is just going to be going into the elementary schools and being able to sort of, you know, take these two years to work with those students and connect them to the information that are outside of sort of our current sphere of Gaithersburg and be able to make sure that all students are aware of the opportunity for one, and then to be able to see where these additional students are to sort of explore some of the different communities and what they're doing in these areas, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Tracy, am I covering everything? Yes, that I would sound? also okay. offer with the expansion um, of providing the opportunity beyond the Gaithersburg sphere that we initially anticipated, we also have the opportunity to obtain information and data that will inform our transportation services and help inform our budget and make those adjustments as we realize um, and move from a targeted estimate to a actualized budget plan. Yes. Additionally, we anticipate working and collaborating with MCPS to ensure that timely notification is provided to all families and students within the district in multiple uh, grade levels, both elementary and middle, for the opportunity that will afford them um, with MECA and our MBLI program. Just one final question. Um, the, the vision that you have for the, the, the charter, um, and, and so you're looking at the phased in enrollment, grade seven, year one, and then adding in a sixth grade class each year thereafter. Um, is your vision that a student say, didn't know about the opportunity or didn't think they were interested when they were, you know entering into sixth grade but maybe grade 10 
they think that they would have interest? Is your program one that you would you would welcome students to kind of Absolutely. Absolutely. All students, we welcome and encourage any student and family that's interested in business opportunity, financial literacy, um, entrepreneurship to we welcome them to our school at whatever grade level we are able to accommodate them at. We are prepared and have built in um, into our design a rolling acceptance process that will allow them to be um, relatively easily incorporated into our program, even if there may have been some things that we did in the year before. So we definitely anticipate that and welcome that and encourage it. Uh, Dr. Daka. Wow, thank you. Um, I did read through the, the big binder that had a fully developed <laughs> curriculum. Very, very, very nice. I mean, you covered everything in there. And I noticed that you're going to concentrate on Chinese, uh, which is a good idea. And also, I noticed that you're uh, looking at startup, which is uh, a federal grant kind of thing. We've used that here in the summer, and we know it's very effective. Dr. Alan Chung has been in charge of that for about the last eight years, and we've had uh, students, all kinds of students, who have been involved in the program, and they learn to speak, and they do poetry, and they do their science project in, in Chinese. Uh, also, um, the building is sport and health, used to be sport and health that you're looking at. It has some challenges. I know that you know that. But it is a nice big building and uh, certainly could accommodate the numbers. And also that you're going to have uh, teachers are going to stay longer, like an hour and three quarters longer. I guess the kids are staying longer, too, which might be, um, well, should be an asset. And there will be a number of students from that area that speak other languages. So I think you gave a, um, a figure uh, there that sounded low to me, but yeah. And the last thing I want to say is that Gaithersburg is one of the neediest areas in the county, but it is the geographic center of the county, so you can draw from anywhere in the county, and it's not going to be like Frederick County. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you so much. Miss Ohlone. Oh. Yes, I just had a question about this uh, 611 figure, the number of people who have pledged support. Um, were you able to verify that these people are MCPS families or live in Montgomery County? Who, who, who are those people? So the 611 is a, is a variety of uh, respondents within and across uh, the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. And what we did when we uh, submitted our application last year, we validated, I want to say, 300 plus of those uh, signed up petition, well, not petitions, petitioners or supporters. Uh, we were able to validate a little over, I think, 300 of those persons that were uh, had a Montgomery, that provided, let me say that, that provided their uh, either an email address or an address of some sort. Uh, we were able to actually validate and connect about 300 of those people. And then there was, I want to say, a roughly a little under 200 people that had children in uh, either in or uh, were adjacent, either a grandparent or another family member that had students that were uh, connected to MCPS in one way or another. And so we have about 50% of our people we have been able to validate as actual MCPS um, residents, so. Thank you. Yes. Ms. Ms. Silvestri. Um, yes, Ms. Hazel. So I wanted to understand what is the recommendation of the school system so that I'm clear. Thank you. I should have said that before we started the questions. I apologize. So we are uh, recommending that the board approve the MBLI charter school application with the contingency that they meet the budgetary requirements uh, for attaining the furnishing and renovation of the building by July of 2023 for a 2024-25 school year opening. And so that did also get to uh, Ms. Harris's question. And uh, if I could ask the, the charter school mem uh, founders, uh, could you restate, I know you mentioned it, but I didn't quite understand. What is your plan for getting the funding for the renovation and the furnishings? So part of what we're doing in this space is being able to leverage our Maryland State Department of Education grant 
for the use of either government funding in the terms of the school bonds, which we are eligible for as a public charter school, uh, for a construction loan, if we need that, or for a traditional bank loan. So there are three portals that we had determined we were eligible for, the bonds being the most favorable because of the interest rate opportunities and because being a public charter school, it connects us to the municipality and provides the credit backing of the municipality in attainment of the bonds and a favorable rating as it relates to getting the bonds. So it, that offered us the best opportunity was the school bonds. However, we can go the traditional route of this bank loan for any amount that we need, or we can go the route of just a construction loan, which we would still be leveraging our state grant for to, uh, the attainment of those funds. So basically there's gonna be a combination of resources depending on the need. Uh, once we actually get the facilities pieces mapped out, some of the things can be uh, funneled through the grants, and then some of the pieces will have to be funneled through either the construction loan or the bonds, et cetera. Does that make sense? It's not my area of expertise, but I think I'm following along. Um, okay. What is your estimate of the cost of the renovation? Well, for Russell Avenue, we didn't necessarily estimate the cost of renovation. We determined the amount of money that we could reasonably afford using the state grant as the leverage. And so using that money as the leverage, we determined we could afford $2.7 million, of course, if the bankers tell it or the, the financiers tell it, we can afford more. Uh, we could leverage that and, get, and actually access more money. However, where we feel comfortable is the $2.7 million. And so for our end, we would work with ProMark partners to sort of ask them to accept that component towards whatever renovations because it is still releasing the facility from them. And so we would have a shared responsibility with them in terms of how we maybe want to adjust the building. And they are already aware of our intent to use it as a school. They have actually mapped out for us how it could be used as a school, which was good. Um, and so they're prepared to support us in this endeavor. We just determined how much we could come to the table with. And you and to add to what, I'm sorry. I was going to add into what LaShondra was saying and, and just connect it back to something we discussed in the presentation. Again, they have discussed with us which portion they would be open to renovating in a lot of the... Uh, property owners have and commercial property owners have been open and willing to make some renovation adjustments in preparation for our uh, operating in the facility. So that will defray some of those costs and could be very um, helpful in the space that we're doing. I was, if I'm remembering correctly, you operate uh, charter schools in other parts of Maryland. Is that correct? No, no. This will be our first charter school. Oh, okay. However, we are experienced with authorizing charter schools and exactly. doing work with other charter schools in the state of Maryland on behalf of um, school districts and as consultants. Yes. And in your in your area of ex in this in this experience that you've had as consultants, um, you mentioned in your executive summary that you are committed to educational excellence for all students, but in particular students that are at risk. Um, in your, cons in your uh, advisory role or consultancy role, I'm not getting the term terminology correct, but what, have, what are some best practices so that not just parents who are in the know apply to uh, your charter school, but really uh, all underserved students have uh, the opportunity uh, to apply and participate in the school? First and foremost, remember that um, this is a school of choice. And so we wanna make sure that any student who's interested, any family that's interested, will have the opportunity to participate in our program. And we wanna communicate that to multiple students. Our goal is to support students who may be disenfranchised with the current educational process, may not be as connected. And those, were, um, those are often at-risk students who have one foot in the door and one foot out. And since the pandemic, we know that that is um, um, even more of a struggle with many students and families. So our goal is to one, make sure we're communicating through varying uh, resources and outlets to let families know, to offer them opportunities to connect with us, interact with us and understand the school, the policy, the expectations, and be transparent about those things and the development of our work um, up until the opening of the school. And students who are interested, again, because we are a school of choice, we are welcoming and open to all students um, and 
encourage their participation in the program because we think it will be a wonderful extension uh, for the Montgomery County area of service offerings to continue this um, dynamic, rigorous nature of excellence that we provide for students in academic settings. And from a research uh, or best practices perspective, one of the main things for these for students that are disenfranchised, as she mentioned, one of the main things is you know, being able to add additional time during the school day. We know that there's a lot to cover in terms of content and it's not a lot of time. And so being able to sort of have flexibility around how we provision what time looks like in our school allows what Tracy mentioned for uh, earlier, our flex scheduling blocks where we can work with students on a different level, a, a supplemental level, an enrichment level. We can provide them outlets if they want to explore other subjects because sometimes students are just bored and they may want to just sort of change the uh, think about things in a different way, explore uh, other subjects. And so we want to create sort of, we have the opportunity with our scheduling is to provision those opportunities for students. And so with an additional school day, being able to dedicate additional time to math and English, which are the core of all of this work uh, is, a, is important. And then the other piece from our best practices is being able to support the whole student through health and wellness. So we know a lot of times that, you know, social emotional wellness is, uh, is, is left unaddressed in some communities. And so we're factoring in a lot of new practices in terms of uh, the restorative pieces. I believe that the titles are Tracy, uh, our peaceful schools, our restorative practices, um, our mindfulness. Um, so we're trying to sort of work with them where they are academically, but then look at the whole student and then move from beyond the whole student to the whole family. Because a lot of times the student is who we see, but there are issues that may reside in the family. And then that's where our team of support services folks comes in, our psychologists, our, our counselors, our social workers, and all of those pieces will help to sort of support the full family, which then strengthens the student who then comes back to us ready to work and ready to learn. And can I just add also, um, should they be approved? Um, certainly these are our MCPS students and, and staff, so we want them to be successful. We will work very closely with the charter school um, to ensure that similar to our other choice programs, they are included in any of our communication to parents, any of our open house and all of those types of things so that our families know that this is another option just as we have uh, choice uh, schools programs in our, our county. So we'll work with them. <clears throat> And my final question is, um, and you're fully prepared to serve special education students and English language learners? Absolutely. Well, of course, of course. Um, and, and to what Ms. Uh, Harris was asking us about earlier is, uh, and, and what someone else mentioned is about our demographic data. We understand that we are going to get a variety of students on a variety of levels. And so it's not just special education, it's meeting all of the students where they are. And it's being able to target interventions and supports to all of our students. And in doing that and setting up those programs and those plans, we are provisioning, of course, extra support for our language learners because they have to be able to speak the language to communicate the language for our special education 504 IEP students. We want them to be just as successful. So we're prepared to modify our curriculum. We're prepared to provide the, you know, the teachers with the extra supports in the classroom as needed to ensure that provisioning our program and our services is able to be done with ease and with support. And then where, and we are not perfect, right? So we did a lot of the work but there's still some things that we're going to have to iron out. And we're going through professional development, similar to the school system. We want to engage our staff with, hey, how do we fix these things? How do we connect better? Where are some things that we could do better, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think part of what this is, it is just we have a vision. We've done a lot of this work, but we are open to hearing from our families, hearing from our, the staff members, hearing from MCPS as we need to, to make this be the well-rounded vision that we see and to ensure that what we're doing stays at an above the level that MCPS envisions for us. Because the same way MCPS envisions excellence for its community and, and its students, we want the same thing. We are coming out of the community, attempting to fill and address a need within the community. And to add to what LaShondra, uh, Ms. Graham has said, I will add to, we anticipate working much like 
Ms. Hazel has indicated very collaboratively with Montgomery County to ensure the excellence of his programming is continuous in our program as well. Um, we anticipate being able to provide assistive technology as needed. We anticipate being able to follow 504 plans, IEPs, and all of the accommodations and modifications required in addition to providing additional assistance and supplementary support based on pro our program and our unique design model that may offer additional assistance in areas um, that may not have been captured by the original IEP or a 504. Thanks, Liz. Ms. Mandrowski. Yep, just a couple things. First of all, um, you keep mentioning anticipated, and I know you can't say anything necessarily concretely because you're not actually up and running yet, but um, anticipated does mean going to, correct? Like, in other words, you can, anticipating being able to support our special education students, we, they would of course, once we're approved, know that we can, that's right? What we're, that's the anticipation. Once we are approved, okay. we'll move into execution, which will allow our plans to be realized. And they are um, prepared to, again, mirror and reflect a lot of the best practices that Montgomery County currently employs to support students with a 504 plan or an IEP or English language learners. Thank you. I am concerned about the um, transportation aspect in terms of if you have students enrolled and then it's deemed that transportation can no longer be provided when it was previously, what happens to the students who can no longer get there? And do they just go back to their home school? Is that how that works? If they choose to not enroll with us, like if for if for some terrible reason, which let's just say we're not planning for, but in the event that something happens, catastrophically impairing our ability to provision yellow bus transportation, the students are still welcome to come. Um, their parents can bring them by car. Uh, if they live in the neighborhood, we can help provision carpooling. Um, there are a variety of ways that students can still access our program um, that we will explore we have a grant that we applied to two, year, uh, two and a half years ago uh, to provision bikes. Um, so there are a variety of ways that students can get there. But our plan is to try to provision the yellow bus service because we do understand the importance of getting all of the students to the school. And so our goal is just to make sure that we can make that happen and design and working with the transportation department, uh, if we work with them and have them guide us in, in the development of that programming to ensure we're successful in that space. But the students are still welcome just because we not opt, may opt to not offer transportation for some reason they're still welcome to come to our school. No, I, I would have, I would have it, but it's more about can they get there, <laughs> not yes, whether so they're well, welcome. Anyway, we recognize that we need to provision, and the ideal and optimal situation is to provision transportation for students. But often, but what we have endeavored to do, and what we often do as our work, is look not just at the short-term expectations, but long-term planning. And we look at both everything working out in our favor, as well as worst case scenarios. And we want to make sure we are giving the best broad look and strategic planning for any of those outcomes. So with that being said, we try to communicate to you that in the event that we're unable to provide transportation services, that this may be um, something that could occur, although we don't anticipate it. And in the event that that something like Ms. Graham said is catastrophic occurs, that we're unable to provide it, we will then provision other um, mechanisms for families and students to be able to access our school. But again, we are provisioning yellow bus services. We are not saying that this is not going to be something we're doing. We have every expectation to provision it. So my last question is, um, I, I, this is open to everyone, but targeted for um, more at risk um, kids. Um, how are you addressing enrollment in terms of either, like if you are over, is this going to be strictly a lottery? So anybody who's interested expresses interest or applies? Uh, I'm well, assuming it's not an application. After, 
Yeah, similar to the special programs that MCPS currently operates, Mm -hmm. we accept applications based on the number of available seats that we are advertising in any given school year. And then if we have applications that exceed the total number of seats that are available, then the assignment of those seats then moves into a lottery distribution process. So then that, uh, so once we move from, but a lottery is not necessarily automatic. That is only in the event that our applications exceed our available number of seats. But that is the similar that is the similar way that the special program schools are currently operated across Montgomery County now. Okay, I guess. That's- All right, can I um, get a motion? I Oh, that's right. Okay. Yes, today is just discussion. Well, we want to we want to thank you for the yeah. presentation. Love it though. I like it. It was. It was <laughs> I, when she said when Carla asked you about the recommendation, that's what made me yes. think about. So we'll that. come back on the twenty sixth right. of July. But we want to thank you for a very detailed presentation and a very detailed application. So thank you. And we'll be thank you for having us. And we thank are you. so excited to work with you guys to bring this vision to reality, to again extend the course offerings to provide an amazing program to Montgomery County students. So thank you so much, everyone here who has lent time, space, energy, and vision to our work. We appreciate it. In particular, Dr. Marcus, who has been invaluable to us. Thank okay, you. So, so a very special thank you to Dr. Marcus being out of retirement and lending his new uh, new role to this work and to, to uh, Nikki Hazel, who has been uh, by his side guiding his efforts in this area. So we uh, thoroughly appreciate both of those persons. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay, we're now up to item 10, consent items. Does anybody have any item they want to pull? Lynn? I'd like to pull item 10.6, please. 10.6? Yes. All right. Is anybody else? Can I get a motion to move items 10.1 through 10.20? with the exception of 10.6. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. Lynn, would you want to go ahead? Now, I was wondering if uh, Mr. Adams is still there that could um, uh, just talk a little bit. I mean, I think the work envisioned in item 10.6 is really um, of great interest to our students and our communities and our staff. Um, around the uh, bringing uh, wellness center space into the 19 high schools that currently lack that. And um, if you could just address um, sort of the timeline um, that we're looking at with um, 19 projects being envisioned, you know, conceptualized and designed. And then, um, but with a single contractor to do the work, how we're going to, to manage that. So, so that's a great question. This is a, uh, a, a ambitious effort, which we, we did map out for, for the county council. Um, we have procured long lead items like furniture already working through our procurement office. Um, so part of this RFP was the, the request for the, the contractors to put together a plan of the, how they would meet the, the ultimate schedule. Um, their plan that was submitted does include some temporary provisions for long lead items. So, you know, we may have temporary doors in place until we come back with the permanent doors uh, a little bit later in the fall. Uh, but this particular contractor did put together a plan that would open these spaces and allow them for, for occupancy and use at the beginning of school year. Um, this is going to involve around the clock uh, Saturday, Sunday work. Um, in order to do this, um, and that's provided we, we receive approval today and and uh, and let them start tomorrow. Um, but yes, this is uh, this is ambitious, but it is a, a one of our our you know highly qualified contractors that that we we definitely will will support throughout this endeavor. And I know our schools have already offered up their support uh, because it is going to be quite a bit of work, even for business managers at each one of these 19 high schools to to work through. Uh, this process as well but great question and it will come down to probably the last day of of summer break before school opens but uh you know we do we do intend to have all spaces up and running 
uh, but we will ultimately have to come back and put in permanent items you know throughout the fall as, as those items come in and believe it or not doors door frames those things are actually long lead item items now um, you know different electrical items are long and lead items mechanical so you know we'll, we may have some temporary provisions but uh, they will be ready for students at the beginning of school and and we will be working very closely with each of the 19 schools as we move forward so just um, a clarifying question. I, um, so what you just described, is that sort of um, the explanation for what the, the resolution means when it says we're using a construction management at risk project delivery method? Yes. Yeah, so this this particular approach um, involves the the construction manager performing more more services than you would typically see under a general contracting focus so so they are performing some of that planning work they are um, coordinating with schools they are obviously lining up um, contractors subcontractors to do the work that's necessary to to, to complete it um, so it does add an additional layer of supervision to the to the project similar to some of our larger projects yeah thank you Thing, you know, so we are committing here to having um, wellness center designated specific wellness center spaces fully staffed by the opening of the school year at all 25 high schools. Um, and, you know, just, um, you know, we take a victory lap. So, so, so just to clarify, the staffing is not MCPS. The staffing is right. through, uh, you know, health HHS. services. Yep. So, so we will, we are making the commitment that the spaces will be ready for staffing of, of health, the Department of Health and Human Services, which I know they're working very aggressively on as well. So we're, we're ready to do our part. Uh, the portable classrooms have already, um, you know, been awarded as well. So they were part of this work. So uh, we're, we're committed to being that partner and having the spaces ready for, for our partners and students on, on the first day of school. Yeah. Yeah. Um, again, just um, such a reflection that what we've heard and seen from our students and our school communities this year has been heard. Um, so I think this is huge. And, you know, letting all of our school high school communities know when they're when they go by their buildings this summer and they wonder what the heck's going on. That's part of what's going on. Ms. Mandrowski. I have a question not related to this one. It's just a kind of a follow-up question to one we've already approved it, and I'm com I'm comfortable with the, the approval. It's more just a question about the telecommunications centers. Um, just a making sure our school, the schools whose um, leases we are renewing here, they're aware that they've been up for renewal, correct? So, so this isn't necessarily a renewal. It's an ad additional supplemental to the existing tower. So it will add, if approved, actually, I guess it was approved, it will add additional revenue to those schools. So uh, this process still has to work through, you know, the county process to review this. Um, right. But ultimately, should the county process review it, yes, the schools would, would uh, be eligible or they are going to receive additional uh, lease revenue from these, uh, these add-on uh, providers to these existing towers. And I was just more confirming that they're they are already aware that that we moved this forward and everything. So, okay, thank you. Can I get a motion to move ten point six? So moved. Second. Second. You're fine. We all second. <laughs> all in favor, raise your hand. <laughs> that is unanimous. Thank you. Okay, um, we're now up to item 11. Can I get a motion to move items 11.1 .1 and 11.2 in block? So moved. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. Uh, we now have an appointment to the ethics panel. No, I don't think I have it from here. I don't have it. Okay. All right. 
We're, can I get a motion to approve, to move, uh, approve Lisa Tom's reappointment to the board of, to the ethics board? I move to reappoint um, Miss. What's your name? Lisa Tom. Lisa Tom's to the ethics panel. Second. Is there any question? Any question? All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Does anybody have any new business? Okay. Item number 12 is for information only. Can I get a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. Thank you.